screen. Uh, President, Director Corbett, the reason is, is that we have the um, agenda up. After we, um, thank you. All right, the meeting is live. All right, everyone prepared to go. Welcome. This is a uh, special session of the Board of Directors of the East Bay Regional Park District. That's a workshop designed to uh, uh, air the uh, priorities of the board and with a greater emphasis this year than in years past, uh, management, both the general manager and the uh, others in uh, management positions. Uh, we hope to have this uh, workshop a, a lot more interactive uh, than in the past. Uh, so with that, it's uh, 12.36 on June 23, 2022. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Yes, President Coffey. Director Lane. Here. Director Corbett. Here. Director Wieskamp. Here. Director Waspy. Here. Director Rosario. Here. President Coffey. Present. General Manager Landreth. Hey, I'm here. Deputy General Manager. <laughs> there she is waving. De uh, excuse me. Elizabeth was waving. Director um, Eccles. Sorry about that. Present. Thank you. Uh, Deputy General Manager Alvarez. Here. General Counsel Burgo. Here. AGM Cook. Present. AGM Johnson. AGM O'Connor. Here. AGM Kelchner. Here. Chief Chiabaro. AGM Chief, CFO Upper. I'm sorry, Chief Chiabaro is not here today. I'll be standing in for him to make a presentation. Thank you. AGM CFO Ocker. Present. Have I missed anyone? President accounted for. President Coffey. All righty, with that, I will turn the meeting over to the general manager. All right, thank you, President Coffey and members of the Board of Directors. So uh, let me run through it. We have a few logistical matters and then I have, uh, I'm gonna run through the agenda, planned agenda for today and we will launch into it. So um, just really quick on the room setup, we are spaced right now for to adhere to our COVID protocol. So we have uh, some staff in the in the room here, but we have, as you can see on the screen, many others that are joining online just to be in adherence with our protocol. So um, this is a reflection of a whole lot of people that are have been working to put this meeting together. So I really want to thank everybody for all of their participation and pre work that they've done. Um, the v the meeting is being recorded, and we will post this just like we do any other um, uh, uh, official board meeting, so we can go back and reference it. I do want to go ahead and um, introduce Claire Griffin, who is our new management analyst, is in the room here with us today. And Claire is going to be helping out by taking notes later in the agenda. So um, everything will be captured. Uh, you don't necessarily have to take the notes yourselves. And um, this is a study session slash workshop. I know that we um, normally, as it's told, relayed to me, would be offsite in a more casual environment. Totally agree with you. It's what we had hoped to do. Um, but as you all know, we're still living with the realities of our of our um, the pandemic. And so um, thanks for bearing with us as uh, as we are in a little bit more of a formal environment than we wanted to be. So we acknowledge that um, on the agenda. I will go ahead and maybe if we could put that up on the screen, that would be great. And I will run us through it. Welcome, Claire. Nice to see you. <laughs> could, could I ask Claire to take her mask off briefly so we could see what she looks like? <laughs> Hello. A lot like the picture Thank we were you. sent. <laughs> it, 
And I think Claire's in her second day on the job here. So we're just th throwing her in on the in the deep end, but she's got a lot of experience working in local government. So um, we have a lot of confidence and really thrilled that she's here. So as we see here, we've blocked off most of the afternoon to try to cover quite a bit. Um, we are going to start with, I have a few introductory remarks and we will do a, just a very brief fiscal overview. Um, Deborah Ocker will do that as our CFO, just to provide some context and some, um, just some situational awareness on, on where we are in terms of our, our fiscal situation as we launch into the priority conversation. Um, then we have the new results from our community survey that have not yet been shared with the board. So um, th that will be led by government affairs and they will um, be providing some of our community feedback on priorities. Um, and then this is very new as President Coffey mentioned, which is we are going to have the divisions run through some of their uh, priorities and work plans and uh, initiatives and really highlighting some of the, the challenges um, that, uh, that they, they see that we're going to be facing for, for next year. Um, I put a break in there. Obviously, we can just see how things go and take a break as you see fit. Uh, the capital improvement program will, this is really just meant to be a preview, a teaser, if you will, um, for the July 22nd study session that um, we will we will uh, cover in much more uh, depth next time. And then certainly be able to pivot to the board members and have a recap after that. So that's our plan for today. Um, just some, some other context setting. This is the third study session of 2022 that we have had. The next one, as I mentioned, is on July 22nd. And I really just wanna first thank President Coffey, um, and really all of the members of the board for over the course of the last year, providing a lot of feedback and um, desires and comments about uh, these workshops and uh, what you like about them, would like to see changed, and really just to thank you for giving us the space as a team here to try something a little bit different. And um, this is a work in progress, so certainly would uh, welcome the feedback as we go through this. Um, and I had a chance to watch the tape from last year and um, and learn a lot from that. So um, this is not not meant to be a retreat. Uh, we've talked, uh, I think I've talked to each of you about that at length of a desire to have more informal chance to get together in a facilitated retreat. And our hope is that we'll be able to do that in early 2023. As a, as a full team and do it in person. Um, so, so more to come on that. Um, as we go through this, I think, you know, you will see some recurring themes. And one of them is that uh, at a staff level, we are really looking forward to having more robust discussions around long-term planning, including the uh, update of our master plan as we go into 2023. So that's going to be a theme that you certainly are going to hear. Another thing is, as I have been listening to you all, uh, I have heard a very strong desire from the board to make sure that we are providing context to you as we work through the district's priorities for next year and beyond. So that's again part of part of our goal here is to provide some context, and then and then also really respecting the board's role as policymakers. Um, as you know, we've been working very hard. It, both individually with each of you as certain projects come up to not bring them to you fully cooked, um, but rather to come to you much more uh, you know, earlier in the process and much more often to get the board's input. And so we're really looking forward to starting to put more structure around that as we do the strategic planning as a, as a full board. Um, so as I mentioned, you're going to hear today the, uh, some feedback from our community through the survey results from our CFO about our financial resources. As we know, we can't do anything without the, those, the, the money. And then directly from the divisions um, per, per the request and feedback that I got from you all. Most importantly, we wanna hear from you. <laughs> so I heard that you wanted to make sure that the list of priorities that have been provided to us in the past really get taken into account in a, in a real way as we develop our work plans um, for the full agency. And 
also that you receive feedback from the staff on those items rather than just have it go into a list and kind of ne never be to be discussed ever again. So today, what we're going to do is a little bit different, which is we're going to have a chance to capture those items um, from you. But then we are going to have an opportunity to come back to you on July 22nd after we have had a chance to analyze some of those items that you've provided to us so that we can have a more robust opportunity for you to discuss those as a board and provide some priority to us. So there'll be a little bit more space. So we're not going to do the, the exercise of prioritizing those uh, real time on the spot. So we'll be able to give some feedback to you. Um, again, that's, that's uh, something that I heard from several of you. Um, so staff is certainly excited about the direction that we're moving in. Uh, I want to just say one thing to all, everybody that works for the, the, the park district. I have heard you loud and clear as I've been doing my site visits for the last year um, that your number one request is that you would like some help on prioritizing the vast volume of work that you have and, um, and that you don't have enough staff to do everything um, all, all at once. And so this is, this is one of our attempts is to start, start this, this level of discussion and, um, and to be able to provide some real-time feedback to the board um, on the, uh, the long list of things that I know, know you all want us to, to work towards. So with that, uh, I wanted to go ahead and uh, have Deborah Ocker provide uh, her brief <laughs> fiscal overview. It's hard to, it's you know, one of the hardest things is to do, to, to boil down these complex issues into a short amount of time, but thought it would be appropriate for us to start us off today with, the, with some of that context. Good afternoon, uh, Deborah Ocker, Assistant General Manager of Finance and Management Services. I'm happy to be here today. Let's see which presentation. Here we go. Let's get this started. So um, a brief fiscal overview today. I remember in December when I was before you presenting the budget, we said uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. And it still seems that way. Um, right now we have the highest inflation in 40 years. The Fed has increased interest rates by 75 basis points. It's all very interesting times. But um, I'm going to just, I have some numbers up here. I haven't shared my uh, screen yet. Let's do that. Um, I have some numbers, but I'm just going to talk through them for you. Let's see if I can share this quickly. Here we go. That's better. Okay, now I'm live, right? There it goes. <gasps> Okay, so lots of numbers, but I'm just going to walk you through a little bit. This is basically the district-wide balance sheet from the audited financial statements with some uh, comparative data. We presented this to the Finance Committee yesterday, the final audit. This table shows that the Park District is in good fiscal health. The assets have grown and the long-term liabilities have decreased from the prior year at this particular snapshot in time. So this is December 31st of 2021. And I say that because the annual report includes marking things to market value and market value has been what's been going up and down lately. So it, um, it's been changing over time. So let me highlight a few areas of importance on this chart for you. Our, um, our investment portfolio, our general cash and investments have grown by over 5%. Um, again, last year, we did post some unrealized losses showing that the market was um, in a changing state um, and interest earnings do remain unpredictable. Um, under cash and investment, the bond information there, that's our bond proceeds that are received from Measure WW and Measure AA. And um, here you can see that it went down because we're spending our bond money. And so that's a good thing. And in February of this year, you can recall that we issued our next, our, our set of uh, additional $60 million in bonds, and we refunded $4 million in some other uh, bonds that were issued. So this, you know, after this snapshot that will increase both our assets and our liabilities with that bond issue. We also have our pension trust at about $10.9 million right now. 
The other large asset are our capital assets. So on this uh, sheet here, it shows our land and our um, all of our facilities, anything that is capitalized. And that has grown by 2%, reflecting that the district is making investments in these acquisitions, in capital improvements, and so those also increase our net position or our fund balance. That's where a lot of the growth of the district ends up remaining. So another area that's really important to look at are long-term liabilities. And I already mentioned that our bonds are listed as long-term liabilities, but we have our general uh, obligation tax levy that helps us pay for that. So our pension, our net pension liabilities are the other largest um, liability of the district. And so I wanted to just drill down into that a little bit. So here's a little table just to show in that center column are the actuals as of December 31st shows $56.5 million of liabilities, net liabilities in our pensions. Now, some of those numbers above that total are, are in a negative state. That means that those liabilities became assets because of the market. So at December, actually these were uh, mostly valued at June 30th of the prior year because that's um, when most of these funds do their valuation and then adjusted for December. But anyways, our, our net pension liability definitely decreased from the prior year, but the majority of that is based on those market values. So just to give you a sense of that, PERS in the 2020 year earned about uh, just over $12 million in interest. Um, during the 2021 year, they earned, um, what did I say, uh, 62 million. And the news as of June 15th was that their assets had decreased by 10%. So that's just all the uncertainty and volatility. But just as of our financial report, um, our pension liabilities have um, been reduced. We have a funded status. Let's see. So am, I wrong, can... am I wrong in looking at that number and thinking that is huge? <laughs> I mean, eighty-one it's, million dollars. It's the mar It's it's truly about the market value. So we are due to get our next um, actuarial report coming up in August, and so that will help us to understand what's going on in the market today. But it really does go on. The one thing about our Calpers investments are that the valuations happen and then the rates don't change for a year and they spread them over a period. And that CalPERS has really been trying to um, implement policies and mitigate volatility. But, you know, the world has been quite uncertain lately. So it's affecting their portfolios as well. So in total in the yellow there, when you add that up, that's our CalPERS net liability, 74, uh, almost 75 million, and that is reduced by 54 million from the prior year. And then our, our uh, in the green, the pension assets are made up of our OPEB, which are the retiree medical benefits, the closed retirement plans, and those are at 18 million as a, as a positive. So our funded status based on that has increased over the last year. It goes from the OPEB fund being 112% uh, funded to the CalPERS plans being about 85% funded. So not bad news, but we will give you an update when we get more information about how the market has changed. Okay, so this is a very busy table. I'm sorry, I can give you a copy of this later, but this is showing our general fund revenues and expenditure trends. So I've been trying to go back to 2019 because 2020 was um, during the pandemic and it was a little different than normal. So I wanted to just show you some comparative data to 2019. And then um, the other more recent columns are the current year budget for 2022. And then um, we also did some projections on how we think we might end the year. I don't think we've done this for you before, but just showing um, how we think we might end the year as compared to budget. So one thing I wanna point out that was in the financial report is that um, that middle column, actuals 2021, those do show that we spent a little bit more than we brought in during the year based on all the activities. Again, some of that has to do with marking our investments 
uh, to market value. So I think without that, we were in the positive, but we were using a little bit of fund balance. So that's not, um, that's not unusual here. And then um, you can see that uh, salaries and benefits are really um, half of our expenditures. So that's, that's um, something we wanna keep our eye on. Okay, so on the revenue side, our property taxes are in um, still in growth mode. They are expected to grow for the next year at about 6% is what we're hearing right now, um, based on increases in the values, assessed valuation, and new construction. So we expect to hit our target this year and have um, around 6% growth for the future year. The charges for services are just getting back to the pre-pandemic numbers. Um, we're seeing more activity and more things are open. We already talked about interest income being, uh, being different, certainly different than it was in 2019 or less. And um, so we don't have any recommended revisions to our revenue budget at this time. We feel like the information we know supports what our budget is. On the expenditure side, we've been reviewing with our general manager our five-year trends and showing that um, we have had some, you know, average ongoing savings in our budget. And so we're working to implement new best practices to um, maybe make adjustments for that. In this 2022 budget, we implemented a 4% vacancy rate, but we still feel like there will be additional savings um, just because of the, the different turnover and things like that in our budget. So we just wanted to point that out. Another thing to look at at the very um, last column is that if you just look at our growth uh, from 2019 to 2022, general revenues grew by 11.6%, but expenditures look like they grew um, more than that by 21%. And we want to we want to balance our revenue that's coming in with our expenditures that are going out. So we want to look at that. So you already know all of the big cost drivers, you know, like I said, salaries and benefits are over 50%. Um, the inflation is kind of hitting our fuel costs, our utility costs are definitely um, going up with garbage recycling and water fees. There are supply chain issues uh, with our capital outlay. Construction costs have escalated 15 to 20% per year in the last few years. I think you've seen that in some of the projects that we've approved. And um, we continue to seek grants um, and go after those where possible. So just giving a little history of our budgeted new positions as we go through our annual budget process and we do have funding available for growth, you can see that um, we've been growing over time. During 21, we kind of put a hold on that because we didn't know what was going on with the pandemic. And then last year we made up for that a little bit by trying to, um, you know, just really focusing on all these new users in the parks and knowing that we need to, um, you know, continue adding staff to support our, to support all of our visitors. Just a little one slide on projects. So we are very fortunate that we do, uh, we have available to us our bonds and uh, initiatives and we seek grants and are very successful there, but the district funds about 32% on average out of the general fund for our capital projects program. So that's important for us to make note of. Go back to that last slide. I just wanted to also say that I know you're familiar with the fact that we do some planning for opening of new parks to see what kind of staff projections we might have. We call that the pipeline. And so if you look over our, our planning document right now over the next five years shows if we do these developments and we open these new parks, we would need about 59 new FTEs that are basically like field staff operations, stewardship, and public safety for about $10 million in ongoing cost. So just to give you that kind of quick analysis of future. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. All right. Over okay. how much time? Uh, that was over five years. Five years? Yeah. Okay. So this is also a slide that I have shared with you in the past. So although we are really good at looking at one year at a time, 
uh, as the general manager mentioned, we we really need to look farther out and do additional long-term planning. So looking forward to um, create funding strategies for these unfunded needs that all look familiar to you, opening up new parklands, um, uh, long-term maintenance for our unpaved trail systems, renovating and maintaining our swim and aquatic facilities, what we're calling natural infrastructure, which are, you know, our lakes, our ponds, our, our streams, and anything that is um, affected by natural disasters, shoreline restoration, cultural resources, um, our conservation lands, really putting together our monitoring program, meeting all those requirements, wildlife and resource protection, all those things we really um, wanna put into our long-term planning. Currently the board has been so successful in our strategy for fuels management. And after that presentation on Tuesday, I can see we still need more money, right? We had, you know, last year we talked about needing from 40, million to a hundred million, but our, our um, fuels management is uh, very costly these days for us to continue working on that. And we've done a very good job with our major infrastructure funding policy of putting money aside for major infrastructure, but we do have about almost $90 million in deferred maintenance because we've, we've uh, assessed that, we've done an inventory of that. So we can talk about that and plan for it. And we need to do that for the other areas. So that's about all I had to go over with you today. I just wanted to give you some, you know, forward looking for the budget cycle. We'll be reviewing the district-wide goals and initiatives, calculating out the current level of service that we have, like our base budget, evaluating our staff needs, evaluating the impact of inflation, and then um, using this new prioritization policy that we'll be bringing to you as we consider uh, the future budget. And that is all I have for you today. How'd I do? 15 minutes. <laughs> did uh, Sabrina, did you want to add to that? Yeah, no, thank you, Deborah. And um, this was not meant to get into too, too much of the, the details around the upcoming uh, budget conversation. That, that's going to come later as we're still crunching the numbers around that, but just wanted to give a little bit of context. We um, are healthy financially. Um, but uh, not, uh, not unusual to any public agency, certainly do not have the resources that we need to do everything. So um, we will, hence the desire for us to start talking about some of the priorities. So th thank you for that. All right, uh, if it's okay with you, President Coffey, we're gonna jump into the community survey results. Okay, Eric and Lisa. Hello, Eric Fuehler, uh, Chief of Government and Legislative Affairs, uh, and we're pleased to present uh, some top line numbers from our May 25th through 31st community survey. Uh, for this particular survey, we used EMC research. Uh, it's the first time we've used them, um, at least that I'm aware of, and we were very pleased with the, the working relationship. Uh, they are still working on the cross tabs, so we are giving sort of a high level a uh, preview of what we hope to share in more detail later. Uh, the survey uh, was an N of 600, so 600 people were interviewed. We, they used email, text to web, and telephone, and it was not limited to registered voters. So we were really trying to get a sense of the overall community's view of not only uh, quality of life and parks, but uh, just some of the issues that Lisa will go over a little later. And it was weighted to the demographics of the East Bay and we uh, issued the survey in four different languages. The, um, the main results were uh, in terms of overall uh, viewing of the, the, the mood of the electorate or not the electorate, the mood of the community. Uh, there was a going in the right direction was 48%. Going on the wrong track was 47%, which is very, uh, it's basically even, right? And the four, there was a margin of error for four percent in the survey, so it really is basically the even, which I think is kind of telling. And I, I almost wonder if now it would be a little bit skewed more to to on the wrong track, uh, just because inflation, as uh, as Deborah has mentioned, and gas prices have have increased. 
Uh, at the time in May, the number one issue on an open-ended question for uh, what are you concerned about? Uh, crime was at 25%, it was the highest. Homelessness, and this was, an, uh, people were basically spent spontaneously answering these questions that weren't, they weren't directed. Uh, homelessness was number two at 21%. Affordable housing was third at 15%. For environment, climate change, and wildfires, which would be the closest to our category, uh, there was a 4% response to that, to that, to those issues, which was a little bit surprising. And I bet you if we asked that now with wildfires, it would be much higher. Um, and then surprisingly to me anyway, um, the pandemic and COVID was only uh, the response from 1% of the respondents. Uh, and then on quality of life, uh, just 13% said it was excellent. And then over half said it was good. We, uh, EMC used an interesting uh, methodology where they asked a series of park questions before they even identified that they were surveying for, on behalf of the East Bay Regional Park District. And so when they asked general park questions, um, the, the, the respondents said that our parks are convenient and nice and clean and, and not just our parks, all parks, and as, and as well as safe. And um, uh, overwhelming response that said, um, parks make it a great place to live and that was at 84%. So overall, um, the parks are popular and people think they're convenient and uh, accessible. Um, and so to go into some of the numbers, once we started to talk about East Bay Regional Parks, um, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Lisa. Thank you. Good afternoon, Lisa Baldinger, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst. And so to begin the question series on the East Bay Regional Park District specifically, uh, we did a question that we've been um, placing in all recent surveys of asking, sort of, how do you feel about the East Bay Regional Park District with no additional information? Uh, based off of name recognition alone, 74% of the residents responded a positive response. Once we shared a little bit of a background about uh, re relating us to Tilden and Black Diamond Mines and the trails in the East Bay, uh, it went up by 11%. So 85% of those surveyed have a positive uh, relationship with the East Bay Regional Park District. In terms of uh, items that come to mind for improvements for East Bay Regional Park District, uh, safety concerns, cleanliness and upkeep and increased accessibility were at the top of minds of East Bay residents. But overall, uh, the East Bay Parks and Trails were rated very strongly in terms of our attributes. All who were surveyed, agree, almost all who were surveyed agreed that the East Bay Regional Park Districts are an important part of the East Bay community and that we're a valuable public resource. And so the valuable public resource was at 93% agree that we are. Additional related highlights include 81% identified that East Bay Regional Park District parks are easy to get to. 69% feel that they are safe. 69% agree that they are clean and well-maintained. 80% identified that our parks are accessible and barrier-free to the activities that they enjoy. 84% identified that our parks are welcoming to people like themselves. 94% believe that our parks are important to the East Bay community. And 85% uh, see our parks and trails as being theirs, having an ownership of our parks and trails, theirs to enjoy and to care for. And so these numbers will be even more interesting as we get the cross-tab information. And so in the coming weeks, we'll be working with our consultant EMC research to dive into the cross-tabs with the demographic and geographic information. And we hope to bring back uh, deeper results to the board in July. And, and just in general, um, the, the amenities that were somewhat most uh, popular and um, the services that are most interesting are, are uh, well, uh, visitor use facilities um, and uh, also trails and facilities for historically underserved and then protecting wildlife habitat as well as wildfire uh, 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 vegetation management. Those were the highest concerns in terms of issue areas. And so, we're very eager to get the cross tabs and sort of see, dig into that and see where the uh, responses were coming from, particularly on the underserved community uh, part, of the, uh, part of the list of issues that we were testing. And I also just wanted to say, uh, you know, we've been testing whether we're a valuable public resource uh, since I've been working here and it's never been below 90%. So I think that's a real attribute to the board, the leadership of the general manager, 
staff and staff in particularly in the field because there are ambassadors to the public. Most people don't see the work that goes on in this building, but they certainly see the work out in our parks. And so without that uh, reputation, uh, we wouldn't be able to be so successful in our grant applications if we go out for ballot measures and, and all the advocacy that Lisa and, and I, I and all of you do with our elected officials. So we really appreciate your support. And with that, I guess we would open it up for any additional questions, but I think those are the numbers that we were, we realized we're the number portion of the, uh, with, along with Deborah of the uh, program today. So we didn't want to overwhelm you with too many numbers. So, um, so with that, I'll uh, open it up and see if there's any questions. Just uh, jump in and okay. Thank rather you. than my going um, around. Another good survey. Thank you so much. Uh, have we asked, are we asking the question of are, are, uh, if people are willing to t tax themselves more to support the parks? Yeah, this survey was um, more for uh, trying to determine what priorities uh, the community had. It was not, it was deliberately not intended to be a, um, a, a ballot measure type survey. Um, and, and interestingly enough, that was one of the reasons we chose EMC research because their approach was very holistic and uh, we really appreciated that. So it, it was not, we, we did not ask the uh, threshold amount, dollar amount. So are there any, um, what would you say were the um, major, not necessarily surprises, but uh, significance uh, elements that you, that you turned up in the survey? So if I'm if I'm hearing the question right, what what would I consider the most significant elements of the survey? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, for me, the the fact that wildlife keeps popping up as like the number two issue uh, is just really surprising. Um, usually, it's been something more like water or, frankly, safe and clean restrooms and facilities. So that's been um, that's been on the uptick in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and then the fact that COVID is so far uh, down the list of things that people are concerned about was also very surprising to me. Uh, maybe it shouldn't be, but just given what we've been through, I would think that would still be a fairly high concern. Um, and then we still continue to see fire as an issue, even though it wasn't the first thing people said when they were asked an open-end question, when, we, when they were asked if it was an important aspect of our work, it's still right up there at the top. And so we're gonna continue to work on, on our advocacy for that. Did you have any? You know, if you follow social media, and I've noticed this over the last uh, several years, there's been increasing attention to the wildlife that shows up in our everyday lives. People are talking about it all the time now. They see coyotes during the day in, in, in their front yards. Um, they're interacting with deer and uh, raccoons and, and, and all the wildlife is um, coming into the neighborhoods. And I think my own understanding from what little I've read is that it's a function of climate change and adaptation by wildlife. So I think that what you're noticing there and what's standing out is people paying more attention to the status of wildlife and appreciating our, our lands <laughs> and, and our opportunities to provide good habitat for wildlife. Uh, instead of their neighborhoods. I think, I think that's what's on a lot of people's mind. Uh, in this survey, I know the, one of the past surveys uh, had some interesting numbers uh, and we're all, one of the themes we're all uh, talking about and we'll be talking about today is managing for our new volumes of users. Were you testing at all um, the existence of uh, use conflicts? Only in that uh, we tested for expanding our, our visitor use facilities, which includes trails. So it uh, wasn't a specific question about user conflict. It was more about what would, what would make parks more welcoming to you. And that's, that's, that's a, a question that we've found uh, garners a, a more sophisticated response when you say what would be more welcoming as opposed to what is a barrier to use. Um, we, get, we get more responses to the welcoming question. Um, to your point on, on wildlife, I, I think that it's an excellent point. Um, and I think it would be interesting to look at the crosstabs to see if people who answered that question also had climate as a, as a concern. Um, because it's, I think you're right. I think we're, I think 
um, our wildlife is moving out of the wild because there's less of it and they're moving into into communities because they they, they need a space to go. So I, I think that's a really good point. Okay, well, it, it is the, the conflict issue or lack of conflict, however uh, you test, is really fundamental to our management these days and, and how we devote resources. Um, I, I think we all instinctively understand that uh, meeting the volume, the, the volumes we now have are, 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 is going to dominate our, our resources. Um, so I don't, whether it's this survey or future surveys, uh, I, I really wanna keep close tabs on that. I do that when I personally go out into the parks almost every weekend and I wear my badge and the, the park district hat and I just ask people walking by, how was your trail experience today? How was your park experience today? And, and you know, that's what does it for me. Uh, and and I try to keep informed by that. I, I will. I, I, we, we we will ask that question in the future. Um, I will say the fact that um, uh, respondents uh, felt like it, our parks were convenient, easy to use, easy to get to, and also were were clean and safe. It leans into that question a little bit and and makes it. You know, there is a positive visitor use experience currently, um, but I think as we as you're as you're pointing out, as we expand usage, um, we're going to have more, uh, op, you know, more challenges with with making sure that that visitor use experience um, is c continues to be very, yeah. very uh, well regarded. That's you know, that's. I don't want to imply that I expect a lot more negative because of our volumes. I'm getting uh, extremely happy people when I pass them in the parts and talk to talk to them. And if there is conflict that exists, you know, there was a mean dog up on the trail or, or a bicycle came too close. You get that once in a while, but it's not dominating my experience with our users. And that's, that's a good thing given the new volumes. Agreed. Director Corbett had a question. I think, Ann, Ann I saw your hand and uh, Ellen. Need your microphone, Ann. Oops, it went off again. I've been fighting a cough that goes with some things. Anyway, um, are we talking about surveying like East Contra Costa County and Murray Township? There are so many things happening. Look at Doolin Canyon. And I know we had conversations going on between Sabrina and the former GM about using some of Livermore's land uh, as a staging area for Doolin Canyon, sort of a cooperative thing that would be good, obviously for the city of Livermore and this area. And I know we've talked about, we just heard recently that up in uh, the Eastern part of Contra Costa County, there's areas that really don't have the connections that we'd like to see there. So it seems like maybe we ought to be talking about doing some surveying in that section so we get a sense of the demand that we're not meeting. Just a, just a question, thought, I don't know what anybody else is thinking. Yeah, um, Director Wieskamp, we, we have, we have um, asked specific uh, zones and regions in the past. Uh, we didn't do that with, with this survey, just uh, right. as it was a community survey, not a... Not a um, a, a voter survey, but I, I will say that um, the interests of East County have in, have increased um, since uh, at least since we've been doing the survey work for the park district. And uh, also, I know that um, when we've when we've tested in Livermore, uh, it, it, that is also the, the Livermore area, Murray Township, that has also increased uh, fairly significantly in terms of. People, people's willingness to pay and willingness to support the park district uh, and in more ways than they currently do. Thanks. In reviewing um, these surveys, I'm assuming we'll be able to tell what parts of the surrounding park district area got the most questions answered. 
Yeah, that should be that should be in the dem, in the cross tabs and the demographics of those who responded. And where would you say, just generally, uh, these answers were coming from? Open space out in the wild areas or closer to communities where people live. Do we have any sense of that? I, I, I not really. Well, I guess it was curious to me that people find. Um, our park's very easy to get to because um, that, that speaks to proximity to where people uh, live and, and, and getting to the parks and also, you know, presumably if they're either taking public transit or biking or driving, um, they're still finding it easy to access our parks. So, but we didn't, we didn't, we'll have to check the cross tabs, uh, Director Corbett, to, to more specifically answer your first question. Because we weren't asking the questions very specifically in areas. We were just pulling in the information that we could receive from people who wanted to respond. Is that what you're saying? No, they, they weighed it to uh, population uh, and demographics. So, um, you know, the areas that were more populated, would have we would have more, more respondents to the survey. And, and Alameda County would have had more respondents than Contra Costa County. Okay. And... Um, the wildlife questions, are there, are there more of those this time than in past surveys we may have done? I, I, I think it's about the same as the last survey we did, um, which was a, which was a, um, a voter survey, um, but it's, it's pretty high. I mean, it, it's become extremely important for 61% um, of, the, of the folks who responded and then very important for 17. So, you know, that's 78% saying it's a significant concern to restore wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems just what we've been told over the last couple of years, there's more and more people out in the parks that maybe had not been in the past and, you know, taking hikes and walks in the middle of the day um, that maybe they didn't in the past. Do you know what I mean? There's just more people out and about in our parks. So that's nice. It's given us the, those answers. And let's see. Um, I had another question, but I'll come back with it later. Thank you. Uh, oh, I know what it was. When did these uh, results come out? When did we get these numbers? Yeah, I just, I just, um, Lisa and I were just trying to figure that out. We'll definitely have them before the next study session. Um, we should be getting them, I would think, quite soon because we, we received these about the, the top lines about a week and a half ago. About a week and a half ago. Okay. It would be, I know you've heard me say this before, <laughs> but it's always nice to have some of the data before you do the presentation so that we'll be able to, you know, be more responsive um, and understand what you're doing, you know, the work that you're putting together to get this information for us. I always like to have those numbers in advance before the presentation is, is made. So if we can do that in the future, that would be great. And, we, and when will we get the when will we get actual written data on this? Well, if we get the results in the next week or two, um, you know, we could get them to you, uh, you know, mid July, I would think. Mm -hmm. Okay. And your and your point is, is well taken. We will we will add a little more depth to the um, whenever we present to the full board. Uh, we'll we'll add a little more depth. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Looks like Elizabeth else? may have a. Yeah, I have a question. It probably has nothing to do with the survey, but um, you know, we just had an, an election with uh, Martinez voting two thirds to uh, assess themselves $80 per parcel to purchase land. Is that, um, is that anything from your um, legislative <laughs> um, political background that you'd like to comment on? <laughs> Um, uh, because I never thought they would do that. I mean, eighty dollars per parcel. That's, that's, raging inflation. That's, that's, is that's huge. a dangerous uh, thing for me to have an open-ended way to answer. But, um, yeah. 
I would um I would agree with you, Director Lane. I, I would not have thought given when this election occurred, um, as we mentioned before, inflation, gas prices, frankly, the, the war and everything else that's going on, I really felt like voters would be in a no, no to everything mood. Yeah. Um, so how that worked uh, is phenomenal, really. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, Director Coffey, who was involved, and I'm sure uh, John Muir Land Trust and some others probably put a lot of a lot of time on the ground to, to make that happen. Uh, but when we saw the numbers for not only the Martinez, but the, the one for the zoo, which I think is $68 a, a year, it just seemed like really high numbers. Um, so we'll see if that one passes too. I think it, I think it probably will because it only needs 50% of the vote. I, I didn't expect it to win. They asked me to be a co-signer on the ballot measure, and I was really happy to do that. Again, reflective of the uh, goodwill existing toward the park district. But uh, privately, I said, you know, I, that's going to be really hard to get <laughs> two-thirds vote for $80 a year. Um, I, I think it is somewhat uh, uniquely driven by the actual the Alhambra Highlands, the land that was involved. It was um, part of John Muir's holdings. And uh, it's on a hillside overlooking his grave. And uh, I think it's just very, very difficult for Martina citizens to drive by that land every day and imagine it, uh, uh, that hill filled with homes. Um, and, and, and that drove the vote. It's, uh, it's very welcome. Uh, we also, in our, our, our trail plans, master trail plans of the park district, uh, have a, uh, uh, a trail route through that land, around that land, to connect Brionis to Mount Wanda. Cool. Director Eccles had a question. Go ahead, Elizabeth, just jump in. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I, I just had a question about the methodology. You know, I'm sounds like there were 600 people interviewed and they broadly reflected the demographics of the, the district and they weren't all registered voters. So all of those things are good. Um, and that also it was phone and online. And I guess I'm just, I'm just curious how they, and, and, you know, you guys might not have the answer to this, but how they determined like who would answer online, who would answer by phone, or did they just give people, did they reach out and give them the choice or, um, you know, I'm just, you know, and obviously some people would decline and then they would have to, I'm sure they backed those people up with other people with similar de demographics. But I, I was just curious about how they did the, you know, the multi, um, well, the, the, the different ways of reaching people and, um, and getting their opinion, how they how they manage that. We'll get a, a really clean and clear answer for you when we return with the cross tabs. But uh, my understanding is that folks are initially reached out to through the median that the uh, the consultant has for them, whether that be email or text, and they're provided with options on how to take the survey. So within the text, they have the option to take a phone call, to do it online, or to do it via text. So they are given sort of to take it through the medium of their comfort level. Um, so that we can receive data from um, as, as many folks as possible. But we'll get the exact breakdown of uh, who took what mechanism uh, when we come back to the board. Great. Thanks, Lisa. All right. If there's nothing else from the board, that uh, thank thank you both for that, and um, I agree with all of you on digging into these uh, these cross tabs. We had a robust discussion about it when they were hot off the press last week, and um, really some interesting data that I think we'll all dig into over the course of the next month or so. So we will, as soon as we get that. Um, make sure that we're going to share the details with the board, but just wanted to give you the, the top level as we, we launch into this. Um, but no, no big surprises, I think, um, that came, came out of that. All right. So without further ado, we are going to do um, our division presentations now, and um, we are going to run through these really starting with 
operations, public safety, ASD, and um, pu public affairs. Then I think we have finance and management, and then HR. Um, and you will see by the, the length of each person's presentation that uh, kind of reflects naturally. It was really interesting. I gave, uh, gave this assignment to each of the AGMs without um, a ton of instruction on purpose, which they I think some loved and some didn't, um, but really to give them the space to tell, tell the story that they want to tell with you. And it, very interestingly, the, the presentations that came in started, the longest one was th from operations, which is the largest department that we have or division that we have here. So kind of naturally, it was really interesting to see the, the results of the presentations and the themes that came through from our, our AGMs, a lot of consistent themes. And um, a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight on that staffing uh, came out as uh, really the number number one issue and the desire as you're seeing through the polling and through everything we're hearing in the community where we wanna make sure that the level and quality of service that we're providing um, is sustainable. And so um, staffing is, is really was one of the themes facilities uh, certainly, I think was another one um, adapting to the changing climate, uh, desire to use data in more innovative ways, um, and certainly expanding access, um, including to our really diverse community. And then, as I mentioned before, the desire for more strategic planning. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jim O'Connor to kick us off. All right. Good afternoon. Jim O'Connor, your Assistant General Manager of Operations. I, I failed the, uh, the slide number miserably, but um, hopefully I'll get through this uh, soon. Yeah, I'll, I'll move fast. Okay, um, my commentary is, is organized around these five uh, themes here. We've got staffing, climate change, facilities, visitor services, and data. So I'll do that for both my, uh, what we're currently working on, current initiatives and priorities, and then also for our future challenges and initiatives. So moving on, first thing is uh, priorities and initiatives around staffing. So we're uh, thank you board and general manager for supporting uh, increased staffing in the in the current year budget. Uh, as we move forward into the future, we're looking to open more and more parklands. We've done a lot of work in the last decade or more uh, in acquiring parklands, and now it's time to open those parklands. And it takes staff to do that uh, effectively. So uh, I really do appreciate the uh, your support in adding staff in multiple areas within the, the division. So 23 plus new FTEs is great. We have to get them on board uh, working with HR and then we had to get them trained and get them ready to work. So we're in the process of doing that. A lot of transitions going on in the division. Uh, four new park supervisors, those are critical positions in uh, managing that public interface that Eric was talking uh, about. So new, new park supervisors, 32 new park staff, and my UMs uh, just on an informal basis, uh, we have about 20 pending retirements in the next year or so. So that's quite a bit of transition going on, but that's been sort of the game for me for the last 10 years is lots and lots of transition. So we're used to it. Uh, two new supervising naturalists, another critical position, two uh, new supervising naturalists, eight new naturalists. So a lot of transition going on in INR. Uh, one new unit manager, our uh, former uh, Reinhardt Redwood Park Supervisor Bridget Calvi stepped into the leadership position of unit manager and we really appreciate that. And she's getting her feet on the ground. Uh, and then some critical retirements, uh, including one you might be hearing about just today. Uh, Ira Bletz, our regional interpretive and recreation services manager is retiring uh, come September. And then our chief of interpretive and recreation services, Ann Kassebaum, uh, announced to her staff this morning that she'll be retiring at the end of the year. So uh, that's gonna be a huge transition in INR, both Ann and Ira were critical in um, revamping our interpretive recreation services program. Uh, and getting that back uh, to the quality level that we've seen in the past. And uh, it's really on good footing right now. So lots of kudos to both Ira and Ann. Implementing the new trail crew, another thank you to all of you. Uh, this is a new program we're moving forward and the board and the general manager saw fit to uh, move this into the permanent status after we worked through uh, several pilots uh, years. And uh, we're getting that uh, set up now, working with uh, our union labor partners and getting those job descriptions uh, finalized and then we'll get those staff hopefully hired soon. Adding a new swing shift at Tilden, uh, you've been great in supporting our additions of equipment and we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides, but getting a new swing shift over at Tilden is great and, and which includes a new uh, fleet services manager. So thank you for that. 
Moving on, space. Space is a huge issue. Um, even if we find the money to add staff, uh, which we need to do, we need to find space for staff. They need to have staff offices. They need to have break rooms. I mean, to have space to work uh, from a shop perspective. So that's a big one. So one of the things we've done recently is what we call the Albanese House, which is on Redwood Road. We're converting that to staff offices for our volunteer program, Parks Express, and our uh, Parklands unit manager uh, will be housed in that new location, which will also allow our fuels program to have some uh, space uh, at the old Redwood uh, Schoolhouse. So we're working on that. Uh, new renovated residences, uh, I, a big thank you to Jeff Rasmussen for the work he's been doing and helping us renovate some of our, uh, our residences and come up with a new standard, uh, which includes metal roofs and uh, concrete siding so that these uh, facilities um, can resist the weather and also the pest on site that we see in parks. So hopefully this new standard for park residences will serve us well, well into the future. So that's at Vasco, Camper Royal Black Diamond. Uh, another big project happening this year is we're renovating the, uh, renovating the uh, Shoreline Center uh, at Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline. Uh, Sarah Lamborn, our uh, Reserval Facility Supervisor, is leading that effort, and hopefully we're also working on the design phase to upgrade the Pelican uh, group site, which is adjacent to the Shoreline Center. And I think uh, most many of you were out there when we did the field trip to see that and talk about that. Preventive maintenance program, we uh, did a six-year effort to evaluate all of our district facilities. That was an effort led by Eric Holmes and Jeff Rasmussen in finance. And that was evaluating them and coming up with what we call our facility condition index, which is a measurement of those condition, uh, the status of those facilities in terms of their subsystems and how, how much service life they have left. So we've done that. And from that data, we're starting to do develop a, a nascent uh, preventive maintenance program. And we're starting off with roof replacements and electrical upgrades. Uh, looking at those subsystems because they're critical to service life of facilities. So we're working on that. Okay, um, moving on to visitor services. Uh, we're implementing a whole new interpretive sector that you have supported. That, uh, just as a note, that was an outcome of a, a board workshop in 2016 where Ann Kasimam gave a presentation on the status of interpretive recreation services. Uh, the board has agreed with us um, to move forward. We renovated the Del Val Visitor Center, and now we've created a whole new interpretive sector so that in that Livermore area of the district that um, east, uh, southeast corner, we start to expand our services in that area so that we're getting that uh, going right now. Uh, expanding the Adventure Crew Program. This has been a five-year uh, adventure to move on with this new uh, long-term engagement program. And with the board support, we're starting going to hopefully add a third cohort to that program based in the Concord or Pittsburgh area, so out of Thurgood Marshall Park. And uh, we, at the general manager's direction, we're getting started. We have an RFP out. We're gonna move forward with our equity study on our fees and look at all of our fees and make sure that that is not a barrier to people's participation and access to our parks. So we're looking at that this year. Okay, uh, we're continuing our efforts in three stream uh, waste management, three stream recycling. We've got all of our parks that have their, uh, their collection points, their gondolas in the park. So that's all set up now for three stream collection of, of uh, waste. Uh, and then we're moving on, you know, we have a new standard for our uh, containers, our uh, three stream uh, collection retainers that we have out in parks. And we'll start to roll those out every year as we move forward. Water conservation, uh, I think all of you, we've talked about wildlife coming down to uh, residences. A lot of that is a function of drought. And so we're really looking at uh, our water conservation in the district, including how we measure water usage. That's a big part of having to do that with the uh, seven water agencies that we interface with. Uh, we're gonna complete, I, I missed that in the uh, PowerPoint, where we're currently working on completing evaluations of park irrigation systems, especially those that have turf. And we're gonna get eight of those evaluated uh, with Russ Mitchell and Associates this year. That's out of 30 parks that have um, uh, primary uh, irrigation, irrigated turf. And uh, we're gonna complete phase three of the Miller Knox uh, turf renovation, which includes um, completely replacing the turf with a drought uh, uh, resistant species. Annual weed abatement for fire risk reduction. That is a huge topic as we move forward. That's a climate change um, major one for operations is how do we get, how do we manage weed abatement, our annual weed abatement on time so that, especially now that our fire season has expanded so much, uh, it used to be, uh, you know, if we got it done by August, we were still pretty good. Most of the fire marshals and the local agencies were good with that. But now we have almost a year-round fire season. 
And so we need to have equipment and the staff to manage that. And the board has been very supportive of that. And we need to continue that. Data. Um, I know the general manager and I talk about this often, but we need to become, uh, well, this is one an area the district needs to evolve in. We need to become more data driven. We need data to make decisions as we move into the future. In operations, this includes a computerized maintenance management system, a CMMS. Uh, and we have our new chief uh, of mass, Robert Kennedy. He has a big background in this area and I'm hoping that he can lead us in developing a new CMMS that'll also integrate with our uh, VFA or asset management data. And hopefully eventually we'll end up with a, a really um, integrated preventive maintenance program. Uh, implement new permit software, our, uh, what we call our temporary access permits or encroachment permits. That program has expanded greatly, mostly due to the work that pg e needs to do in our regional parks. So we're gonna bring on a new software that'll help manage that process. Um, so that we're working on that. Uh, we've also been asked to really look at our interpretive recreation program data. Uh, who's participating? Who's coming? What are the demographics of those program participants? So we're currently in a process to find a consultant that'll help us to figure out the uh, collection, collection methods and the data sources so that we can really start to do that uh, evaluation and hopefully annually give you a, a report out on what's happening, whether or not we're meeting our goals. Okay, future challenges and initiatives uh, based on the same areas. Let's move on here. Future seasonal staffing. This is a question I started to bring up in the last budget cycle. Um, you know, especially since the pandemic, we've had a change in society. Uh, young people, uh, I know I worked when I was in high school, I worked all the time. Every summer I worked, uh, but that's not the way it is now. We really have a hard time recruiting seasonal staff. Additionally, most schools, including universities now, start uh, sometimes in early August, which really puts a hole right in the middle of our peak season. So I'm really questioning whether or not this traditional model of seasonal staffing or peak season staffing is working for us. We, that combined with year-round park usage, which we've seen in the last, you know, at least the 10 years I've been here, um, which is an outcome of climate change, of course, I'm really questioning whether that model really still serves us and whether or not we can still continue to do that. Um, you know, other ideas about whether or not we have uh, staff that have dual assignments. Some agencies have that where during the summer they may work in the parks, right, supporting direct visitor services. In the off season, they may work on the trails crew, the fuels crew. I think we really need to look at how we deploy staff and, and those types of things because I just don't think this is going to work for us into the future. Uh, and a lot of people in the Bay Area can't afford to work seasonally, right? They need a, a full-time job with benefits. So that's something we need to look at. Training employee development. This is a bell I've been ringing for, for many, many years. Um, I think that uh, if we're going to really meet our workforce diversity goals and our staffing goals and our challenges for recruitment, we really need to start looking internally at employee development and training. We need to get back to having our uh, supervisors academy and our managers academy. And we need to to cultivate that next generation of leadership for the district in-house. So um, one of the things that's happening is we're in the process. Uh, Alice is in the process of hiring a new training manager, and I hope to work closely with that person at looking at uh, employee development uh, opportunities. And we've um, training manager, get her in place and look at those updating our training standards uh, at each classification to make sure we're meeting our goals, especially around safety training. Um, we need to continue to support our partnerships with educational institutions such as Merritt College at Cal State East Bay. Um, those are places where we create a pipeline for employees with the park district. And we need to make sure that we have a close connection with those programs and those, uh, those institutions so that, we, that they know we're here, that there are career opportunities with us. I think we need to really look at that and hopefully the training manager will be a part of that outreach. Um, organizational structure and staff development, um, parkland expansion, traffic congestion. We really need to think about how we're deployed. I already mentioned the idea that maybe there's new ideas around uh, types of positions that work in dual uh, roles in the district throughout the year. Uh, we need to add more uh, staff, especially around like our roads and trails crew. We can't have a single crew that serves the entire district. They spend too much time in traffic. It really reduces their efficiency. So that's something I've been started talking last year about, but we really need to figure out how to do that. Again, the big factor here is not just the cost of the crew, but space is another challenge that we have looking forward. Specialty crews, um, such as the roads uh, and trails crew and the new small trails crew, I really think specialty crews are part of our future. 
It gives us the ability to specialize, develop our skills and our, on our crafts, craftsmanship in certain areas, and also help to take that and then help train other staff, uh, park staff specifically. So I think that's uh, uh, what, what I think the chief calls a, a workforce multiplier. And I think we really need to look at that. Uh, we need uh, an additional trades crew trying to keep up with repairs during the peak season, especially as we open up new parklands. That's a challenge. So that's something we need to look at. Uh, and then also uh, the man just looking at the management team uh, and their span of control. Uh, how can they provide uh, support to our supervisory staff and our new park staff? They, they, at some point, you're, you're also spending a lot of time on the road. And we've, I've done some inroads into this in terms of how we reorganize the unit managers, but it's really time to look at potentially adding a second um, chief of park operations and maybe another unit manager, because it's just getting to the point where we need to have those, those managers there helping our supervisors uh, with the work that they're doing in the parks, direct services. Our major, and major maintenance program, this board and the boards uh, for the last couple of decades have been very supportive of preventive maintenance here. You know, it started a couple of decades with the paving program. Uh, that's a very scientifically based evaluation and uh, uh, recommendations regarding paving priorities every year. Um, we've moved now on to our rest of our facilities, but that's something we really need to make sure we get a better uh, integration, but that's also going to require additional staffing if we're going to keep up with that. So um, we've added some staff in the major maintenance group, which is within MAST. Uh, they do contract work in addition to our trade staff. And so that has to grow along with the development of our preventive maintenance program. Remote meeting uh, resources. I think the one shining star that came out of the pandemic was that we all moved into the digital world, whether it was workflow around uh, paperwork approvals, process approvals, which is great. Um, I know I'm not the printer a whole lot less than I ever used to be. <laughs> I can tell you that much. But that process has really sped up our ability to um, do throughput of uh, workflow. So that's great. The other one I think that I, I think we need to focus on is just my personal opinion. It's something we talked about even before the pandemic was we're a big district. You know, having somebody come from big break for a two hour meeting to Peralta Oaks, this means they're spending another two hours or more in traffic. And we've moved into this world, we're living it right now, but I think we can do a better job at um, adapting to uh, remote meetings and setting up our equipment to do those more seamlessly. Uh, and that's something I think we need to focus on to the future because that's it's really helpful for a district of the size. You know, it won't replace in-person meetings where people have a chance to interface with each other, catch up. But every once in a while, we have these business meetings where it really makes sense to have them done in a hybrid fashion like this. So that's just my opinion as the AGM of operations. Uh, staff facilities, another thing we're focusing on, we have our new uh, standards being set up at Coyote Hills, and that's great. Uh, hopefully, um, Point Penola will be next, but we really need to look at staff facilities. We just really can't expand until we look at these, these options. And it also increases our efficiency in the off-season. And also another big problem we're having is storage, secure storage. We have a lot of theft going on in parks and we need to, to manage that, that issue. We're losing a lot of equipment and having the time. It's not even just a loss of it. That's a, that's a, a loss in terms of cost, but then it's the time that we have down, especially when equipment around weed abatement gets lost right at our critical season. That's really could be a, um, a challenge for us. Uh, the Pateco Corpyard. Um, I wouldn't say that's the best deal we have on the planet. That needs to be replaced at some point. And we need to move over to Thurgood Marshall and, and develop our new corporation yard at Thurgood Marshall. So I'll just, I'll just plant that flag here, even though it's not going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a terrible deal. Anyway, uh, trail maintenance and development. Um, I'll just, you know, I know that the, the board has asked the PAC, the Park Advisory Committee, to examine this issue. Uh, and we're working through some of those, um, but at some point we really need to focus on trails. And as you've heard me say, it's, it is our major recreational asset in the district. It's really common for regional parks and we need to spend some time in that. And uh, trails master planning at some point, we need to start thinking about that because uh, President Coffey, to your point about crowding in parks and capacity issues, uh, trails is where it really hits the, uh, you know, hits the fan. Uh, and we need to look at that and uh, take some time to do some trail planning. We spent some time on trail maintenance. The, the small trails crew is a, a great step in that direction. The Brino's pilot project, which we're hoping to bring forward this fall, is another attempt at looking at how we're going to manage crowding on trails. 
especially in our existing parks, because we can't ignore that. We keep talking about you know, East County and doing some new trail work out there. We, we still have the problem exists in our current parks. We need, and again, I'll just say one more time, we need to consider a second Rose and Trails crew because they're just spending a lot of time and the role they play in trail maintenance and road, um, um, fire road maintenance, that's critical as we move forward to the future. So I think that might be it for me. Oh, swim facilities, just to say, we've got to get in that business big time. We've got to start managing aquatic vegetation. We've got to get out ahead of toxic algae. Uh, and start managing that full time. Um, we need to, uh, in 23, I'm going to come to you with a uh, equipment um, request for managing aquatic vegetation. We have to get in that business. We can't get around it anymore. With climate change, it's just going to be a regular part of our business. And we've got to find a new water source for shadow cliffs. We really miss that facility in terms of community service in the summertime. We've got to find a water source for shadow cliffs because I don't think it's going to get any better. So that's a, gotta be a big priority for the district is, is to figure that out, work with um, zone seven and figure out if we can figure out an alternate water source. And trails management, I think I've said enough around that, but we've gotta really spend some energy and time on that. The small trail screw is the right step in the right direction. We've gotta do some trails planning uh, and then hopefully we can uh, move forward with the uh, Brunos pilot project to test some uh, trail management strategies. Water conservation, that's another one. I'm not gonna say where we talked about that. We debatement for risk management. We gotta to continue to purchase equipment and add uh, staff resources to manage that so that we can get that work done uh, within the deadlines that are set by the local fire agencies. Trail use data is another one. We've gotta get in that business, start collecting trail camera data and trail counter data and doing hard counts. Uh, and hopefully the pilot project will uh, initiate some of that, but we've gotta find out who's using our trails, who's out there, what's happening. So we get some real data. I already talked about CMMS and VFA integration for creating a preventive maintenance program. And then of course we talked about INR program data. Hopefully after we have the consultant works with us this year, then we have to move into the future of actually um, collecting that data, uh, analyzing it, and then producing reports on an annual basis. And with that, um, so stop for questions. Okay, I'll stop for questions and I'll pass it off to uh, uh, Chief Tiley. Jump right in. Hi there, I need to share my screen. Uh, I think we're, we're going to take questions we're first. We're going to uh, ask Jim a few questions. I know Dee has some comments. Go ahead, Dee. Uh, no questions, but comments. Uh, I, re I agree with just about everything you, you proposed. I, I really think it's time to think about splitting the district. I mean, we could do it county-wise. I don't know how, how you're thinking about it, but it almost makes sense to make it county-wide and then, um, by counties. And then... Uh, Having a second Rose and Trails crew definitely back you there. Uh, I mean, just about everything you've you've proposed that you need um, makes total sense. Um, second, uh, the, uh, the the span of control definitely is is uh, it's really tough for the unit managers the way that they're spread out. Uh, both Dennis and I remember when it was all uh, by location, geographic, mm -hmm. and it might make sense to go back to that uh, just to cut down on the travel time and also for accountability for, uh, for the unit managers to, to manage their, their, uh, their charges. So um, I think everything you've, you proposed, I, I, I totally back 100%. So uh, thank you. I, I, uh, we're all on the same track, I think. Thank you very much. Jump in, Kenneth. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I, I, I agree with Dee. I think uh, you've got the largest division and you got the greatest amount of challenges, but I agree with you 100%. Staffing is going to be incredibly important in the future. Um, I agree with Dee. Uh, I, I, I wish you could try geographical unit managers and, and units. It, I know, well, I don't know. I mean, the, the different, I think, I think our staffs are intelligent enough to handle a a lake in their area and a recreational area. It's, I think they can do it. And, and I think it would save so much time, so many resources uh, and, and um, give a great span of control for unit managers and supervisors. I, I just think it works better that way. I, I hope you give it a try. Um, I agree the swimming resources um, or sources of swimming. I think we really, I'm, I'm glad you're gonna try to get a, a Get get a hold of that or, or do something about that because it's it's uh, 
you know, um, uh, how many how many swim facilities we got to open this year? Three out of eleven or something like that. It's it's kids want to swim, people want to get out and, and recreate, and that's a big part of our park district. Uh, I agree with the uh, doubling down on the roads and trails, but I would also like to add, like D and I had all the time. Uh, I know that human resources is really um, stretched out and it's really difficult to hire positions. The apprenticeship program, especially in, in the um, equipment mechanics and roads and trails um, equipment operators, that's an easy, easy promotion from within. And uh, I, I think that would be a very, very simple way to increase that staff and get tons of work done. So um, that's all I have, thank you. Ellen, jump in. Very impressive presentation, Jim. <laughs> um, we could have two workshops just on what you were covering. <laughs> so I'm ready, so Director Corbett. <laughs> what was that? Uh, I'm ready, Director Corbett. <laughs> you are. Well, I chair that operations committee too, so so am I. <laughs> but um, but very very impressive all the things you addressed. I, I I can't talk about all of them right now because it would take me an hour. But a couple of issues you brought up that I think are are really wonderful that you have addressed is the the fact that there is the opportunity of the college classes you've been involved with and the training, you know, and the opportunity to um, bring some more people to work in our park districts because of the work that's being done at some of our community colleges. That's a, that's a really huge, important opportunity that you have really helped build. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I don't really ask, wanna to ask too many more questions because I would talk, like I said, for an hour, but um, just uh, all of the things that you've talked about we need to do, um, so important, a whole list of things we need to work on in, in your area. And the fact that we should maybe split up some things and across the entire physical park district and give people an opportunity to have their meet meetings online, et cetera, et cetera, all, all really important. But it just really shows um, the amazing, important work you've done as we continue to grow and change here in the park district over the last few years. So um, thank you so much for that. Uh, look forward to addressing many of the issues that you brought up in the presentation today. Thank you. I'm impressed. <laughs> I, um, I'm wondering about the suggestion of doing trail master planning. I've always thought it would be an undertaking uh, because it is such a large undertaking that it'd be part of the overall master plan update that we will be doing hopefully within a few years of uh, the 2013 master plan i think was designed for a, a, a 10 year shelf life um so when we do all of that at once rather than or, or do you think we could do trail master planning as a separate uh process well, I can tell you that I do have some depth in this area because um, I was involved in it in my prior employer down in Santa Clara County. And they went through and we actually went out and did a, a site visit, talked to their uh, their management team, including their director, Don Rocha. So um, my experience is that I, I would keep that separate from the master plan. Master plan I would see as a more overall uh, policy document for the district. But trails master planning is a little bit more specific than that. And in my opinion, it's just my opinion, it probably should go on a separate track because it has, is so specialized and will require some resources dedicated to it, just based on my own experience. The, the bigger question is, how are we going to approach it? I know that our chief of planning, uh, Brian Holt, wants to look at a, a district wide, um, which is probably the, gives you the full two county palette to do that type of work in terms of addressing the various user types. Um, but then at some point, you're, just, you're going to do a park by park uh, plan also so you can figure out exactly what you're going to do in specific parks based on the overall uh, trails master plan. So that's just my vision. I've not even talked to Sabrina about it. So I'm just yeah, well, throwing out it as my opinion. My experience is with our 2013 planning process. And I was on the PAC at the time and participated in that. And it seemingly to me, almost every element of the master plan had a trails element to it. And then there was the chapter on, on trail master planning. So conceptually, we, we had an idea of what uh, we wanted to do with trails. Um, you're suggesting that 
there needs to be more detail and depth to the planning uh, of a trail system uh, than what was addressed in the 2013 plan. That's just my opinion, yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, this is great. I, I mean, I'm really enjoying hearing your wish list, <laughs> you know, instead of just ours. And so I really uh, enjoy this and appreciate it. I also want to support any and all efforts to bring work in house where we currently, uh, that we currently send to outside contractors. I, I know we always hear that fr from our union reasonably when we talk about paving and how much we spend on outside paving contractors. Uh, the more we can do the math and figure out that we really can do that in house is, is, is something I would support. And thank you for those suggestions. Anyone else online want to? No? Okay. So, yeah. oh, Beth. Um, yeah, I'm, I uh, appreciate you're going through all these things. And um, I definitely agree with you on, on the significance of trails. That's what people do when they get in our parks or on our regional ones. They're on those trails, and that represents what the park district is to almost everybody. So I, and I think one of the things that we forget about sometimes is, um, is that there are unique trail situations to every single park. Mm -hmm. And it won't help to have a general trails plan that's general. So um, I think figuring out um, similarities is good, but each of these parks, I mean, particularly the large ones um, in in um, Ann and Colin, my area that we've that we've acquired, you know, they have these ranch roads, and of course, occasional narrow ones. Um, we just need to figure out a system for addressing park by park, and um, and not trying to generalize all that much. I mean, there we could generalize more about type of trail, but um, my gosh, they are so different park to park. Um, anyway, then um, some other things, I really um, agree on the issue of doing um, more on in-house training. Uh, I just think that it, you know, once you have a, a, an employee, new or, or relatively recent, if you want to keep those employees, which we want to retain them, you have to help them uh, figure out, you know, what their trail, what, what, their, um, uh, what they might want to do in future jobs here. And one of the things that we offer is a wide variety of things. So we have these people with great biological background, you know, that that start as gate attendants so that they can eventually move to another position. And they may have that in mind, but not all of our employees, you know, have, have that track. So anything that can be done uh, for the in-house training to help retain employees, I think is, should be a really high priority. Um, and your, uh, the interpreting, Interpretive and Recreation Program. I, I really want to compliment you on putting putting them together, and the way you set it up to have um, at least two two parts of that in our um, in the district. We're looking at major change changes there again. You know, with Ira leaving and Anne leaving. Um, and many change, many challenges there, particularly in this in this area where we're looking for new diversity um, narratives. Mm -hmm. You really need to go at it intelligently, and not um, well. You know, our our cultural and natural resources. I was like, let's not just be knee jerk on how we're doing this, because it does need to be addressed. And it needs to be done well, 
not off the top of our head, you know, because I'm seeing people doing wacko things and I don't want us to be associated with that in any way. Um, so anything we can do to help support the, the INR in a, in a way that, that represents the best. And, it, and I, I feel very strongly about um, the park district being a leader in best practices. So one of the things we been. talked about with, with um, um, dealing with issues of native descendants was that um, open space agencies similar to ours are having similar challenges. And, and if we could take the lead to figure out how best to approach these, uh, it would be a real credit to the park district. And then indeed we need more water at Shadow Cliffs. And at some point, I want to talk about why Contra Loma is not open this summer. Um, you know, the lagoon. I, I haven't heard anything other than it's not. And I thought being closed one summer was what you had to do, but to be closed a second summer, I was, I have to say, I was really shocked. So, you know, I like to see stuff get done. And I like to have water for people in East County. So you can talk to me about that later. Yeah, we, we can fill you in on that one. I'm sure we can. Thank you. Okay, we can pass it off to Chief Tiley. Dr. Corbett had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, just hoping we can get a copy of your the report that you just did. Yeah, so I think it's going to combine PowerPoint that Jim's shaking her head. Yeah, so. certainly. We'll, we'll send the, this is all, we have everything in one one big file. So we'll, we'll make sure we send it out to you. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very impressive to keep track of all that. Thank you. Yeah. It's a thank lot you. of information. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Chief Tiley is uh, filling in today for Chief Chavarro, who is out ill. So Eileen, I think you're about to pop on here. There you are. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Directors and General Manager Landreth. Um, I'm Eileen Tiley, Fire Chief. And I wanna to talk to you currently about the 2022 public safety performance measures uh, that we are currently working on. Three of the major areas that I'm gonna be talking to you about are staffing, infrastructure, and fuels. And staffing, um, some of the performance measures that, 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 that those things meet um, are to attract and retain a workforce of excellence. With infrastructure, it speaks to fostering a safe uh, visitor experience. And with fuels reduction work, of course, in the fire department, it's the plan for climate change resiliency. So currently the biggest issue is staffing across um, two of the three aspects of public safety. Um, in police and fire, we have uh, quite a few vacancies. Lifeguard services, ironically, is the only one that is fully staffed this year. And that's a big kudos to um, lifeguard services who were able to, even though we're facing a nationwide shortage on lifeguards, um, continue to remain relevant with the people that um, come to us on a seasonal basis for um, for jobs. So we do have a full staff. We kept track of those people through COVID. Um, we have a full staff, unfortunately, as you was previously mentioned um, in Jim's presentation, we don't have enough water. I will say though, Director Lane, to um, answer your question with regards to Contra Loma, one of the good things that came out of that is Lifeguard services quickly pivoted to make sure we could meet some of the needs of those people, giving them um, areas to go swimming and cooling off in the summertime. And they've worked with our legal department to form a partnership with Ambrose Pool that's, I believe, out in Bay Point, um, so that our gar guards will be supplying swim lessons um, and lifeguarding there to help kind of meet the needs of the constituents um, in absence of Contra Loma. So that is good news. But back to um, our, our PD and our fire department. Um, currently with regards to vacancies just in our um, police department alone, uh, we have five full-time dispatch uh, vacancies, which is a, a quarter of our department because we have um, 20 dispatch staff, staff total. 
Um, we have 14 vacancies in our sworn personnel. Uh, we are anticipating and working on the hiring of two officers in the next few months. And we do have two recruits in graduation um, in November of this year. And of course, we're in the process of onboarding two new captains here in July. We also have a vacancy um, in helicopter pilot officer. Uh, we have a vacancy in our police service technicians. Currently, Fire Station 4 has eight uh, full-time positions and we have four vacancies luckily um or unluckily i don't know in a way uh we're robbing peter to pay paul by using some of our um, ocf staff as long-term actors until we can complete the recruitment that we currently have open for two uh, firefighters but you know this time of year it's it's really important to to have as i put it butts in seats and so we're, we're struggling at this point to do that uh, fuels crew members, we are budgeted for 12. We currently have four vacancies, but we are, are onboarding. Another thing that's really um, creating a little bit of, a, of an issue for us, um, but it's it's we're happy to be a team member with regard to the fuels crew members, is there's not a lot of temporary staffing for uh, operations to pull from. So in absence of that, uh, we are giving our a fuel crew members the opportunity to act as park rangers. As you know, when we first started the fuels crew, um, the idea behind it was development of people uh, so that they could come to the park district in an entry level position. Um, and we would give them half the tools they needed to be a firefighter should they choose to, to go that path and half the skills they needed to be a, a park ranger should they wanna go that direction. And um, that's been very effective. <laughs> um, and uh, to a certain extent, it's worked too well, but we are looking at having the four vacancies filled by the end of the month. And in fact, we're having an academy, academy in the, for the new members in, in August. So um, again, lifeguard services, is the only one that's fully staffed. Um, kudos to lifeguard services for, for pivoting in that way. Uh, the, the challenges that we are finding, and that's pretty much across the board in public safety, our pay, the hiring process, uh, retention. Um, we kind of looked into why some folks are leaving and a lot of it is social or political um, or just the fact that, it, that we live in a, an area that's very got a very high cost of living. And so that, that can be difficult. With regard to infrastructure, uh, Eagle 8 has been deployed, yay. Um, we are down one pilot, that's not so good, but um, having Eagle 8 up and ready to go is great during fire season. Um, when we have so many fires that are popping all around the district. The other issue affecting our infrastructure is um, we have vehicles increase in, in the budget, but no vehicles available with, with supply chain issues. And that's a common theme throughout the park district, but it's especially hitting us here uh, in public safety. Also our radio uh, encryption and replacement, um, upgrading Axon, that's the in-car and body cameras. That's something that we do plan for. Um, but, it, but it's something that we're budgeting for. And with regards to fuels management in the fire department, um, we are looking to um, work as hard as we can on this new pilot project uh, while that we presented to you yesterday, no, two days ago, um, with regard to trying to, to figure out how to deal with the biomass and all the dead trees that, we're be, that we'll be cutting down. Um, the fuels reduction coordinators, we're four strong. Uh, we're really working and very highly focused on um, resiliency in our forest that we manage. That's what's gonna get us through fire seasons better and it's what's gonna get us through drought and climate change a lot better. So uh, those are the areas that we're really working on. Uh, I think we need to go back to the, um, the second slide. Forward one, please. There we go. So focusing now on the 2023 public safety staffing goals, uh, fires and fuels expansion. Um, personally, I, I heard you, um, Director Coffey, that you want to hear about what we want. Um, I am trying to pave the way some point down the road uh, for there to be a duplicate crew, uh, just like the one we have there that you see. Um, I can see that um, two large crews um, could do be busy all year round. 
Um, because remember, our Welfare Hazard Reduction and Resource Management Plan not only does the initial entry, but the maintenance. And um, usually when we get rain, uh, things grow back. So um, I can see fuel, two fuels crews that are identical, one north, one south, working in conjunction um, and not conflicting with uh, operations trail crews. Um, I think we need crews. We have a lot of, of land to cover. And um, it's, a, it's a good way for us to use all the tools in the toolbox and keep as much work internal as we can without um, using contractors. We're always gonna need contractors to do the specialized work that they do, but I think um, that there's more than enough work that needs to be done. But uh, in 2023, all I will be asking for is lieutenant um, over the fuels crew. Right now we have one captain that oversees um, 12, no, uh, 14 fuels crew, 12 fuels crew members and two fuels crew leads that are not recognized as supervisors. They are leads, but not supervisors. And so the span of control there um, is one to 12. We'd like to cut that in half. And so um, an additional position that also would help with uh, retention and succession planning would be to insert uh, a fuels, or I'm sorry, a, a fire lieutenant, that would be a third um, that is between the fuels crew leads and the captain. Uh, I plan on using uh, FTEs that are in the pipeline to, to help facilitate that, that position. Administrative support when it comes to uh, the PD side of things, um, as we grow uh, records and uh, the front desk, there needs to be, we're trying to figure out um, what kind of support and what that's gonna look like to support both patrol um, and the command staff administratively. Uh, currently, we've got um, just a couple of support people that are there for the front test, detectives, records, um, and the command staff. And so we're still trying to figure out what flavor we're going to use when we, when we pick that position, but that's definitely a position that's going to be needed. Um, and as far as patrol and communications go, um, we have grown that in the last year or two. Um, we have increased the amount of um, police technicians that we have, <clears throat> our police service technicians, um, but they can come and do a lot of the work that ties up some of the command staff. Uh, and so it's kind of, we're looking at um, correct staff sizing and really efficiency uh, throughout PD and how to best support uh, patrol and, and um, the command staff or the, the administrative portion of uh, PD. And then next, I think if we can move to infrastructure. Infrastructure currently, this is primarily on the PD side, um, although it does cross over in some ways, um, the Axon upgrade. We are halfway through a five-year contract with Axon. Um, and those are our, you can see the picture there on the upper left-hand corner, that's our, our body cameras. Um, new technology is currently available, available. We have cameras that have a live time incident review. Um, and so we're looking in budgeting to, to upgrade that. That's been planned. We're also looking at a taser upgrade. The implementation of our new canine program. Um, this is to be clear, no biting or apprehensive dogs. We're, we've moved completely away from that. Um, this would be in support of search and rescue, tracking and evidence sniffing dogs. So um, again, no biting or apprehensive or apprehension dogs. We've moved completely away from that. This is more um, of search and rescue, um, location, tracking, things of that, that kind. Drones. Um, drones have become a very important tool for public safety. Merely the fact um, that we span two counties, our sheer um, geography dictates the, the use of drones. Drones can be used um, instead of, in some cases, Eagle. Um, in concert with eagles, they fly at two completely different levels, um, and they really add to not only the public safety of the people that are in our parks, um, and that we can get to them quicker, but also to uh, our employees. If we're looking, if we've got somebody hiding, drones are kind of the eyes in the sky. We're currently trying to figure out and get research on, on what that should look like. We're asking a lot of our um, neighboring fire departments and uh, police departments what they currently use um, but but that we see that as an important tool moving forward 
communication equipment, um, our 911 system replacement is um, needs to be replaced in 2023. It's about a $50,000 ask. Uh, voice loggers reach their end of life, which is an important part of that 911 system in 2023 and are about $50,000. Um, life radio encryption and replacement end of life is reaching its end of life at $100,000, but we have already planned for the replacement of that in 2023 and are budgeting for that as well. Uh, health and employee wellness, um, specific to first responders and public safety, um, there's a group that provides training and peer support for members and mental health um, is public safety oriented. And that's really important as we see uh, across the board, but primarily in police and, and fire, um, an increase in suicides. So health and wellness is a big focus for us. And then Eagle, our twin engine helicopter, this was consultant recommended. Um, it would best suit our needs. We are in a unique situation of, um, we've decided as, as an agency to use our helicopter for two things, which means it can't be specific to either one. So we need something that's fairly nimble. And this is just me kind of, a, I'm, I'm a layman at this. So I'll explain um, a really large helicopter, like some of the bigger fire um, entities use uh, is not maneuver or nimble enough in the air for us to use it as a as any kind of a um, response for police. Um, police need to be nimble in the air. They need to be able to um, move around quickly and be able to circle around in tight circles when their eyes in the sky. Um, but we also need for them to be able to dump uh, a good amount of water. The bucket that we have now and the single engine that we have now is good for about hundred gallons. We have to carry less water in the bucket than we can. Um, doesn't stop Cal Fire from, from requesting us and calling on us. Uh, it just means that it's most effective during um, firefights on light flashy fuels, those are our grasses. If we wanna get into something that's gonna give us a little more um, um, for our money when it comes to uh, chaparral, uh, and timber, of which we have a lot around the district, that'll be a twin engine that can can carry more water. So in short, um, again, it's um, staffing infrastructure and fuels for climate change. And um, we're we're doing a very good job with, with what our performance measures are for 2020, but there are, or 2022, but there have been some challenges and mostly it's, it's staffing and infrastructure. And, and looking to the future, we're just looking to really enhance what we already have um, and make it a little better with either new technology um, or just upgrades. And with that, I've made it as succinct as I possibly can. <laughs> There's any questions? Uh, thank you, Eileen. Um, uh, great report. I, I understand the staffing needs of your departments and um, I hope we can get to that point. I, I um, well, yeah, I support everything you say. I'll, although I would like to put in a, um, a pitch for OCFs. I think uh, on-call firefighters are have been a tradition in this park de department. I know that uh, uh, it's difficult or it's been challenging the last couple of years, but I think it is the best model, as Jerry Kent used to call it, and I think it still remains that, uh, and could be that, especially when. Um, uh, AGM O'Connor has spoken about dual role positions, and I think that's an excellent example of dual roles in the park district where we can have one, one person accomplish two things. Uh, it enhances their careers. It's good for the park district. I think it's good for everybody. So I, I hope you'll consider on-call firefighters. In the Absolutely. Future. I wholeheartedly agree. We have a plan to hire in the fall um, a smaller group, but they are... Um, they are definitely, we've got, you know, three parts of, of the fire part, not lifeguard services, although that's part of fire as well. And that is um, the crew, the permanent staff and OCFs. We could not run the fire department how we do currently without that model. I agree. Great, thanks. Now, thank you, Eileen. Good presentation. Um, just to piggyback on uh, Director Waspy, uh, I too uh, concerned about the, in particular, our low numbers in um, on call resources right now, and um, and I just want to make sure that that we are. I mean, it, this goes back to Jim's presentation of staffing. I mean, we are all of our parks are understaffed, and that lacks, and the parks have the the 
less flexibility to, uh, uh, and I'm sure a lot of park rangers are dedicated to their parks and would like to go to, um, uh, to, to be an OCR, but uh, uh, that loyalty to parks sometimes over outweighs that, that extra dedication to a, a second, second uh, uh, job. But, uh, but uh, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that anybody can be uh, an on-call resource. You don't have to be a park ranger. We used to have clerical, we used to have police officers, we used to have dispatchers. So I just wanna make sure that uh, uh, everybody has, knows that and that, you're, that we're recruiting in that fashion because it does in, in, encompass just about every, um, just about every job classification in the park district with the, with the I think there's a couple that are, and managers were excluded and then um, some trades were too. But I just wanna make sure that ability to, uh, to recruit is, is uh, put out there to everybody uh, that that's a, that is uh, eligible. And then also, I think it might be time to think about cross-training our police officers in a true public safety, um, something to think about, uh, dual role, police officer slash firefighter. Uh, it's, I think it's done in Sonoma, but uh, something, to explore, yeah, six, something to explore. Um, and, then, um, and then on the other, my last thing is, um, I mean, one of the reasons I think Director Waspy and I had uh, advocated for a public safety headquarters on on this side of the um, uh, of the hills and the ridgelands is because a lot of the crime happens on this side, and we're, I'm still concerned about um, having more officers spend more time out in their in their precincts or or, um, or their patrols, and um, I'd really like to see some kind of um, I know we can't we can't call them substations because they they uh, <laughs> their uh, substations confers a whole different type of uh, building and, and capacity and safety measures, but somewhere where the officers can report to a specific spot uh, and they spend more time and to get to know their areas. So uh, that's something uh, I'd like to see explored more, and then. Um, and then as far as the helicopter, uh, yeah, I think I, I had the pleasure of, of seeing the, the uh, Eagle 8. And um, from my understanding there, uh, there is the possibility of a, a upgrade to a twin bladed one that doesn't have, the, that has the same, can carry more, but at the same time doesn't have this, uh, it has about the same decibels, emits the same amount of decibels, which is, one of the biggest concerns for me is like when it flies over the neighborhood, it, we don't create another um, uh, sound um, uh, nuisance to, to the neighborhood. So uh, if there's a possibility where you can get a twin engine helicopter that gives us more wa water carrying capability um, and also keeps that sound um, down to a, a, a current level, uh, that's something we should probably explore. Um, yeah, and then just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same everywhere. Staffing is the key. And being able to uh, recruit and retain and keep um, is, is great. And I really love the, um, uh, the lifeguards going out to, uh, to Ambrose Pool, and I, I, I commented on uh, operations that uh, the lifeguards also went out to Castlemont High School, the pool there, and I hope that that is an ongoing theme for while while our um, while our areas are, are are down, that our lifeguards service the um, the local uh, the local cities. So, thank you very much. Yes, Director Rosario wanted to uh, respond to a couple of things. Um, first, we are going to have a meet and greet um, in our hiring for OCFs. Um, and so it would be wonderful um, to have two former, you know, two former firefighters there, two former OCFs and lieutenants um, that are now board of directors there to kind of give their perspective. Um, that'll be a meet and greet and kind of a career internal career day to the to the park district as part of our hiring process for OCFs. Um, additionally, uh, our lifeguards are not only supporting externally 
programs um, to help our constituents, but they are also um, working, helping support the Parkinet program and recreation um, because they didn't have enough people. So we're, we're definitely a team player with the rest of the park district as far as sharing staff back and forth. Um, I did have one other thing too, but I, I kind of forgot what that was, but um, yeah, I, I will be asking you and director Waspy, I'll feed you uh, if you could come out on those days as we go to, to go to um, try to recruit OCFs. More than happy to come. Well, I, I don't have a lot to add. Thank you for the um, report. And, but I do want to say uh, I've been pleased to see how uh, flexibly we've used, been able to um, employ the lifeguards in this, these last couple of years. And um, hopefully they're having a great experience working for the Park District and they'll want to come and be full-time employees when they grow up. Thanks. Okay, Anne. Chief Tiley, I want to say it is amazing to see our fire department in the event guard looking for what's new and possible. The bio chart was just absolutely fascinating. I think it could lead to so many things, not just for us, farming and all the rest of it, but you do, you're thinking beyond the past and looking into what's possible. And I really admire that. So congratulations to your department. Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I was actually gonna chime in and say something similar. So I will just add to what Ann said by, by saying, well, you know, in addition to this incredible creative work that this is really an opportunity to lead the whole state and, and other places as well. And that I think is, is very exciting because you have this incredible impact here in the Bay Area, but then you also have the opportunity to make that impact so much greater, both in the state and, and beyond. So I, I'm, I'm so proud of the work you're doing. I know you need more resources um, and uh, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Sabrina, how, how are we doing on time? We have several more divisions. Yeah, we have one large one left, uh, which is Christina, and then we're going to get into uh, some of our internal uh, presentations are much shorter. So I think we're moving, we're right on time, actually, right. by one Sounds minute. Sounds good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cameras, microphones. Christina Kelchner, Assistant General Manager of Acquisition Stewardship and Development for the Park District. Um, so um, the Acquisition Stewardship and Development part, uh, Department really division really is at the front lines of the Park District's dual mission of trying to do both conservation and then public access so that people can really get out and enjoy nature. And both parts of those of that mission has become more challenging as you've been hearing already today with climate change impacts, drought, wildfire, and just what it takes to properly steward our lands, um, increased vegetation, and then also an increased awareness of the importance of really providing equitable access not, um, not just welcoming and serving all communities, but intentionally designing for communities. So those are sort of the three biggest themes that acquisition stewardship and development is focused on, um, is equitable access and uh, climate change and increased visitation. Um, in terms of the state of the, depart uh, the division, um, the division has grown a little bit in the last couple of years. And I will say that it has been a challenging time for everyone during COVID, um, but uh, we've had uh, terrific 
retention of our employees of our department. We've had a couple of retirements and a couple of people moving out of state. But overall, we've had, I'm pleased to report that we've had a really high retention rate. And uh, we've put a lot of effort into that. Um, the leadership of the division, myself and the chiefs, and the managers really trying to support our employees throughout um, this uh, challenging time of, of COVID. So um, some stability to report there, which is wonderful. Um, we do, uh, we are continuing to um, open parks and to acquire parks. Um, we're very, uh, still very much engaged in land acquisition. Um, we're up at over 125,000 acres now that the park district manages and uh, owns and operates. We have another 700 con acres in contract actually in contract right now to, to close. And then we're actively working on um, many other opportunities with about 2,400 acres that we hope uh, could come to fruition this year or next year. So very much still doing acquisitions. Um, and uh, I'm also pleased to report that we are expanding the real estate, uh, the land acquisition um, department. We have a new employee coming on board who is, will be the real estate manager, a right-hand person for a chief of uh, land acquisition, Mike Reeves, to help with all of the, um, the huge volume of transactions. And in, in addition to acquiring new land, of course, the land department manages all of our leases, licenses, operating agreements um, that, we, that we do across the park district. So it's a huge volume. And we'll be um, happy to welcome that new uh, manager in July and be sure that you all get to meet him. So um, just as we are um, continuing to expand our land holdings for parks and conservation, we're also continuing to expand opportunities for the public to get access to those parks, um, as well as maintaining all of the existing park infrastructure that we have. We are very actively working on um, a total of 55 projects into the design and construction department in 2022. 18 of those are um, either in construction now or have recently been finished. And some examples of that is um, Coyote Hills, the Dumbarton Quarry Service Yard, um, projects at MLK with Doolittle Drive, the Martin Luther King Shoreline, and the uh, Tidewater, the first phase of that, the Pleasanton Ridge uh, Tyler staging area, and of course the McCosker Creek restoration and Roberts Pool, just to name a few. You do have a handout and this was emailed as well to board members that just shows, um, because this map is very small and hard to read, it has a legend of, of, of active projects that we have going on in design and construction. So it's really just a huge volume of work that the, that the park district is, is doing. And that has grown in my time here over the past um, four years of um, me being the AGM in this department, there's just been a steady uptick of the volume of um, construction work that we have going on in design, design and construction. So we are continuing to provide those facilities to folks. Um, oh, and I will say that with design and construction, another huge priority of course is um, renovation of the building next door at 2955 Peralta Oaks for a new um, public safety headquarters and administration uh, building. Um, one of the biggest challenges in design and construction is contracting and procurement. Um, our processes are not, have not kept pace with the volume of work that we are doing. And so there really are some efficiencies we could create there by looking at our contracting and procurement procedures. And that is a priority for us in 2023. Um, oops, let me go back one more. So, um, and then uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier today, in addition to buying the lands, we also need to open lands. And so we are working in the planning um, department and across the division to um, actively very much to open parklands. And um, we're excited that some of those are gonna be coming to fruition in the near term. We do have about 15,000 acres currently in some kind of a formal planning process with um, coming to the board in the near term to approve plans for public access. And some of those major efforts are um, Pleasanton Ridge is the one that you will probably see uh, in the nearest term. And that's 2,500 acres total. We'll be bringing forward a land use plan amendment to open the Robertson's called the former Robertson property, property um, with the completion of the new staging area at Tyler Ranch uh, there in Pleasanton Ridge. That, that will be a staging area and new trails that will lead up into the Robertson property where the peak is um, that will give us a 2,500 acres of new lands, staging area and trails that will be open for public access. 
um, this year, by the end of this year. So we're excited about that. We also have um, the Southern Lost Trompas land use plan coming to the board this year. Of course, Thurgood Marshall Regional Park. Um, we have an adopted land use plan and designing construction is working on moving public access forward there. Um, in Black Diamond Mines and Clayton Ranch, we are working with the HCP. Um, a lot of those lands are HCP lands. So we're looking at um, getting access through some of the uh, Clayton Ranch areas and into that um, HCP land. So we're working on a preserve management plan with the Conservancy for that. Um, former Roddy Ranch has been to the board several times. I'm out in Deer Valley. That will be new trails of conversion of that former golf course, public access there. Um, and uh, Sibley Regional Preserve, um, the Western Hills open space will be a new staging area and trails that will be coming to the district. So quite a bit coming online. All of these project has, projects, as the board well knows, have been in process for years. Um, and it's exciting to see some of these things coming to fruition. And it's also, um, as you're hearing from my other colleagues, uh, staffing and um, figuring out how to run and manage these parks will certainly be a priority for the district. Um, okay, and then on the um, protecting natural and cultural resources side, the park district's most important tool for conservation is still the acquisition of land. It's still the protection and preservation of natural lands from development. And we have had remarkable success with that um, with over 125,000 acres of land, as I mentioned, that we have protected. Within that 125,000 acres, about a third of that, about 40,000 acres of, those, um, of that land is subject to even higher levels of management and monitoring because they're mitigation lands for development elsewhere. So that includes the um, Eastern Contra Costa County Habitat Conservation Plan, about 15,000 acres there, and then with the balance being mitigation for development elsewhere. Many of those lands, most of them have regulatory requirements for monitoring and reporting to the resource agencies, um, grazing and phase of weed control, things that we, ways that we manage our lands anyway, but there's an extra level um, because they're endangered species that need to be protected and monitored and managed. So the park district does have those obligations to, and in perpetuity to manage those lands for the benefit of the species. Many of those lands do have um, endowments. So we have lots of pots of money to help us do that work, um, but it's a big program. And one of our priorities for 2023 is making sure that we formalize that program and we have enough staffing and resources and systems in place to manage it and manage it well. Um, of course, one of the things we do is um, science-based solutions. And with our division of um, over 20 folks in stewardship that have uh, a really plugged into the science, larger scientific community, um, and some of the examples of that are monitoring least turn populations, other shoreline bird populations, and understanding post-fire recovery. Um, there's wildlife cameras and research going on there to understand for some of the catastrophic wildfires, how are those lands recovering now? And uh, restoring habitat is um, a, a big, a really a big issue. Um, and in the Bay Area in particular, conservation, preservation, acquisition is important. Restoration is increasingly important as we adapt to climate change and um, uh, provide habitats locally for that. So um, restoring, uh, responding to climate change is more and more becoming part of a bigger part of our work. Um, and uh, you just, what it takes to steward land these days is not what it took even 10 years ago with drought um, and wildfires, even floods um, and uh, sea level rise. They, these are no longer kind of one-off events, but have become our new reality. So um, we do things to try to um, reduce our impact, of course, with carbon cap capture and every acre of land that we preserve that isn't developed is another acre that can sequester and hold that carbon. So that is an enormous contribution that the park district makes um, to the footprint, the carbon footprint of the entire East Bay. Um, and then in terms of adapting to climate change, we are restoring ponds, the, um, our stock ponds out, um, particularly in the grasslands out in the Eastern areas are, um, are critical habitat for red-legged frogs, for California tiger salamander, for Western pod and turtles. And, um, so we need to do things like take an inventory. We, I think we've counted up to 500, we may have twice that, and to understand the status and the needs of those ponds is, is really important. Um, 
And um, of course, we've taken a leadership role in managing vegetation to reduce wild, wildfire risk. Um, and uh, a lot more of that work is needed. Um, and the final thing I'll say about climate change is that it really is going to depend on regional coordination. It's not nothing that any one agency um, can do alone. And um, we have started those efforts. The um, district is, uh, the board is, of course, familiar with HASPA, is a regional effort along the Hayward shoreline. And another thing um, we're doing that our stewardship department is really spearheaded is called Nature Check. And this is um, an interagency coordination effort that is between um, us and state parks and several water districts that are the major landowners in the East Bay. And you've been hearing about this, been uh, presentations to the board. That is a sharing of baseline data to create a baseline for what's happening in the East Bay with natural resources. And we'll come back over the years and get a longer term view of how um, climate change is impacting those resources and where the, um, the best place for investment of resources is as we respond to climate change. So in terms of strategic planning priorities um, within ASD, um, the Capital Improvement Program. As you've been hearing today from um, our CFO and others that we just don't have enough money to do everything we wanna do. We have several uh, lakes and uh, you know, water bodies that need um, a lot of attention. And so how do we prioritize our capital um, projects in a way that is transparent to the public and has some, um, some rigor and criteria behind it? And you're gonna hear more about that later today. So that's certainly a big priority for the ASD um, division. And then an update to our master plan, um, visioning for the future and um, a trend that's happening in um, agencies is to do more of a visioning plan um, that is really at a pretty high level. And then as projects are ready to come forward, then the more project level analysis and environmental review is done at that time. So more to come on that. We'll definitely be kicking off that process next year and, and more to talk to the board about what that would look like. Conservation lands program, as I mentioned, we do have a lot of mitigation lands, conservation lands that we need to be sure we're stewarding um, correctly. And then uh, closing and then trails planning. And, and um, Jim had a good discussion, um, uh, AGM O'Connor had a good discussion about this. And I wanted to just make a distinction for the board that we in the planning world make, which is there are regional trails. There's the regional trail network, which includes um, trails that connect you from one park to another. And so that's the Bay Trail, that's the um, Bay Area Ridge Trail, Delta De Anza Trail, Iron Horse Trail, those regional trails. And um, there, that is one body of work to do that trail planning. And then there are trails that we call in-park trails. And when we talk about natural narrow surface trails, we tend to be talking about trails within Briones or trails within our parks. And um, those can be two different sort of planning exercises and the master plan or whatever we're gonna call the master plan, our larger visioning document um, is, uh, is really effective for doing regional trail planning for the Iron Horse Trail, for the Bay Area Ridge Trail, those kinds of trails. When we talk about um, in-park natural surface trails, as uh, I think Director Lane was mentioning, that really is a park by park um, endeavor. So that uh, in each particular park, what is the topography? What is, what is the use? What are the needs? And so I'm um, looking at doing uh, some really park wide, but within one park um, planning for that. So happy to uh, take any questions. Um, and I did make a note here that inventory and assessment of our existing natural surface trails is really where we need to start um, in terms of, we say we have 1300 miles of trails. We don't really know um, exactly how many trails that we have. And so that is something that we would be looking to do to establish a baseline and do some, some planning from there. Um, so again, climate change, equitable access, um, and uh, increased visitation are some of our biggest challenges moving forward. So I will take down my screen and happy to answer any questions. Anyone have comments or questions for Christina? Thank you, Christina. Always good. Um, clearly, uh, your department is uh, uh, kind of overarching. We we can't do anything without you. 
<laughs> and that's actually true with this whole park. <laughs> well, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, a big question is, uh, I'm going to respond to your uh, trail assessment. I think Patrick Demons uh, did a uh, assessment of all of our small trails. So we have, I think we have that on a, a database. So we're kind of ahead on that. Yeah, th thank you. We do have some pieces of yeah. that data. There's just some some more work to do, but yeah. yes, thank you. But um, what do you, um, where do you see the park district when we finish out WW? Where do I, like, when will we finish it? Can yeah, your... so our, 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 uh, I'm envisioning when we, we, we do update the, uh, the, the, the master plan that we have a vision of when WW ends, mm. where will we be and what, what are, what's our focus going to be? Are, are we going to, I mean, are we anticipating that WW is going to buy all the land that we projected to buy, to acquire? Uh. And at that point, where, where are we? Where, what do we? <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent question, Director Rosario. And I think um, one that is will probably be a lot of discussion over the next 10 years with the board. So I certainly don't have an answer for you now. I think um, WW was never intended to be um, all the money that we needed to do everything we want to do, either on the acquisition or the development side. It's almost seed money for, and then that we leverage then to get other people's money. And so I will just give the short answer that I think the park district has a lot more acquisition to do. So um, I don't imagine that once we spend all the WW money that we'll be done with acquisition. I think we're nowhere near done with, with acquisition. I think that maybe we've acquired the, the more straightforward, easy pieces of land, mm -hmm. <laughs> but now um, it's, uh, the, the transactions tend to be a little more complicated, yeah. but, um, but we have a lot more to do. Okay, great. Yeah. So we're, we're looking forward to possibly extending WW which is good to know. <laughs> um, and then other than that, I, uh, I'm just really happy to see stewardship de um, uh, department really grow in the last six, six years since I've been on the board. Uh, it's been um, uh, a priority of mine to, to, to make, to see that grow. And because we absolutely needed it and we needed the data and, the, uh, and their expertise. And I just want to, uh, uh, show my gratitude and appreciation for uh, your leadership and also their their work. And uh, so thank you for this presentation and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> thank you, Director Rosario. And really thanks to the board for their support of stewardship and um, the data gathering. Nature Check is something that's been in the works for quite a while. And having those regional co collaboration and data focused um, effort is, is really important. And we appreciate the board support and the Regional Parks Foundation um, helped to finance that as well. So appreciate that. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a quick question. Don't know if we have an answer to this, but you know, obviously many parts of the um, shoreline we have, um, you know, we have areas of parks. In some cases, we're in between those areas. Do we ever have conversations uh, with the city of San Leandro to discuss that large piece of shoreline that is in between, um, you know, the oyster, the oyster bay area, and then, um, you know, the Hayward, the Hayward uh, shoreline that we have. Do we have, ever have any conversations with them about how we can possibly work with them? I know at one point I asked whether we could look into um, shoreline um, opportunities for shoreline hiking a little bit above the actual edge of the bay because looking at the future, what that could mean that we might not have access and that we should maybe start thinking about that. But do we have any conversations with them? Because that's a pretty big piece of um, pathway there, um, connecting our connecting our parks. Mm. I don't have a specific answer for you on that particular parcel. The park district is talking to all 33 of our cities all the time, and um, particularly with sea level rise, our stewardship staff, planning staff, and you know, land acquisition staff is always in conversation 
with cities. So, uh, but let me take a note of that one and get back to you, Director Corbett. And I can, um, I suspect that uh, Chief of Planning, Brian Holt um, has more information to share about that um, as well as uh, Matt Grawl, Chief of Stewardship. So let me get back to you on that one. Yeah, I, I haven't heard about much um, discussion with San Leandro. I, I think we have with Hayward. Um, that it would be something we should probably look into. And I'd like to know specifically if we are, yeah, we do have- some I can look into that. And of course, we're talking with San Leandro about the the, uh, the trail, the San Leandro Creek Trail, um, but I can find out what else. Thank you. Yes, I'm talking about along the bay. Yep. Yeah, I'm very familiar, of course, with that other thing you brought up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the map. You're welcome. I love the maps. And um, the way you've categorized things is, is, um, is really pretty interesting. I just, um, well, I want to congratulate you on a 95% retention of employees. You ought to get an ongoing applause for that. <laughs> and, Thank you, uh, Director Lane. We, we invest a fair amount of time in, in that. So thank you. Um, and then I um, really appreciate your just uh, focusing on on the public act or park access because um, I know sometimes we say we can acquire property more easily than get the access. Yes. And uh, so for us to to point out where we are expanding that access, I think is just a really important thing. Um, and then. I'm. Um, you know, we didn't. We didn't have the name Thurgood Marshall. You know, until recently, and and so I'm. Um, I'm impressed with how often it comes up as a possible answer for different things, because it, indeed it it is a, a really exciting piece of property, and it's a um, property and park that. Um, people are beginning to acknowledge is in place. And right now, uh, Concord is having a really challenging time with the rest of that property. And for us to be able to successfully you know, expand and also to use, um, you know, expand Bailey Road and then and then to be able to use some of those buildings in a constructive way to support the parks is I think just a really exciting project. So um, thank you for working on that. And thank you for the everybody for paying attention to the, what the possibilities are uh, for that property. Yes, thank, and, thank you, Director Lane. And the fact that we um, got the grant deed um, which we, um, which the board knows we received just a month ago, I think. Um, we got the grant deed for um, our half of the former Concord Naval Weapons Station, which will be Thurgood Marshall Regional Park. And um, getting that secure and making sure that we had full ownership was a huge priority for myself um, and of course, Chief of Planning, Brian Holt. So um, we're in a good position there, especially what's, what's going on with Concord and their challenges. Um, yeah, and that was wonderful news. You know, constructive possession is one thing and right. possession is another, right? Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much um, for the presentation. Good good snapshot what's what's happening in that division. Great, thank you. Anne? Yeah. From the very small things to the very large things, such a grasp of what's going on throughout the district. Uh, it's, I'm glad you're retaining all those employees because they have, a, they have so much knowledge of everything. It's like sometimes people forget about the fact like the Ohlone, that is a very, very special place that not many people get to, but those that do go there enjoy it thoroughly. And so we are so diverse 
And I, I give you and your department so much credit for keeping track of all this and moving it forward. So thank you and all your employees. Thank you. May I call okay. oh, Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. I, I, when I look at this and in your department or your division, I, I get a little schizophrenic. I, I you know, <laughs> acquisition and then stewardship and development. And I know you have all those tasks. And I know, especially us, say, open up parks, open up parks. Come on. I hate <laughs> the status. I, I have been, when I did my priorities, I had these immediate needs that it were immediate needs that I felt pressure on. Um, I guess I would only say that I, I'm very happy that you guys stick with the long view. I think we ought to take the really, really long view. When I think about some of our acquisitions, the Bay Trail, the Ridge Bay Ridge Trail, the, the Water Trail, um, I think those things are going to provide the real legacy for this park district 100 years or more down the line. So um, I guess I would just... Uh, well, stress, I really appreciate Mike Reeves and his group that we continue to buy stuff. I don't think there's, they're not making any more land than we've got. And <laughs> uh, I, I think we should grab it while we can. We're working on it. Thank you. <laughs> it sounds like you're all at, uh, at capacity. Director Coffey, absolutely. We are all at capacity and all of those 55 projects that you saw in active construction are really managed by just a few people. Um, and so everyone in DECO has um, multiple projects and really is full <laughs> at full capacity. All of those projects um, are in the budget book. I meant to mention that as well. So they have all been approved by the board and allocated funding. But um, there is certainly, um, work that's not being done to the level that we would like it to be done. And uh, the staff is very much at capacity, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna have to toss about half of my uh, wish list <laughs> <laughs> on that news. So, uh, Director okay. Covey, quickly, I, I don't know if you saw my hand, but are you, if you're done, I'll just jump in or go ahead. Yeah. Jump in. Okay, great. So yeah, very quickly, because I, I don't want to get us behind here, but I, I did just want to, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation and all of your hard work. It's very impressive to, to see it all laid out, just, to, you know, just the amount of your responsibility. So I'm really grateful for that. And also appreciate that your view is in response to Director Rosario's comments that um, you believe we have a lot more acquisition to do because I think that's that's true. And as much as we say we want more acquisitions, more parks opening, there's always so much more to do. And and I do think it's a tribute to you and your team that you you have managed to retain so many people. I think that's that's fabulous. And um, yeah, so so great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Um, President Coffey, in the interest of time, we're about 15 minutes behind where we hope to be. So um, I, what I thought would be probably a good use of time, we have three other divisions, but two of them we can we can probably put off. Um, I, but I do think be, in staying with the theme, it'd be good to hear from HR <laughs> because uh, you're hearing a lot of the needs are around staffing. So if you would want to take a break now and then we can come back and do HR and then pivot to you all, or if we want to do HR quickly and then and then uh, take a break after that, it's really up to you. Oh, what do people think it might be a good time now to take a break? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's do it now. How long? Short as you can make it. <laughs> can do it. Take 10 minutes and it'll be a bit more. 10, ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thanks. Ten minutes. Yep, I'm starting it now. Okay, thank you. Let us know when it's ready. I will. Thanks. Okay, we're going to get going again. Or are we waiting for the stream? She's going to let us know in just a second. I guess we're waiting. And yes, while while we're waiting, since we're not recording yet, 
Um, I did mention to a couple of you, and you're going to probably see on the media, we are battling two fires right now in the district, one over at Pleasanton Ridge and another one over at Crockett Hills. So uh, we're on it there. We're working with all of our regional partners and we'll keep you guys posted. And I can confirm the meeting is now live. Thank you. for the All right, we'll resume the meeting. General Manager. Yes, thank you, President Coffey. Our next presentation is from our AGM of Public Affairs, Carol Johnson. And um, after that, we will go to HR. Thank Thanks. you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I am Carol Johnson, um, and I'm pleased to be here um, and pleased to be uh, with you for another week, and then we'll transition. <laughs> um, but today, I want to just uh, give you an, up, an update on the 2022 um, activities that are going on in public affairs. I wanna start by kind of reiterating what public affairs role is in the district. We are the big picture focus for the agency insofar as working with the administration and with all of you, our, our elected officials, to anticipate and manage and collaborate for, our, for the district's reputation. Essentially, uh, we also are about building stakeholder relationships and, um, working uh, with the various communication um, uh, interests, including media communications, issues management, crisis, which is probably what we're doing right now, um, having to do with the two fires, um, community social responsibility, uh, information dissemination, and strategic uh, communication advice um, to all of our AGMs and departments when it comes to messages about the district. So it is, um, my pleasure to uh, introduce now what um, our uh, units are, have been, are and have been doing. Um, effectively, I manage and the public affairs uh, AGM manages five units um, that include community relations and engagement, archives and history, uh, public information, the, uh, the um, creative design group in Pleasanton, as well as the Regional Parks Foundation. So I'm going to give you a quick update snapshot on what, what we are doing. I have purposely let, let off, left off uh, 2023 initiatives because many of the 22 initiatives will obviously continue, but I'm going to let the new AGM once appointed to develop what they think is appropriate for 2023. So let's start with community relations. Um, Community relations and engagement um, work in four specific areas. One is, is about communication um, with regard to our brochures and our website. Previously, the community relations manager also had the responsibility of communications, but uh, that became too big for that one position manager. And so we've split out some of the communications. The one that is left with brochures and website is still under the community relations manager's domain. So park maps have gotten total revamp this year. And uh, as of right now, we have created and updated 24 with seven more planned by December. Um, interpreter brochures are also getting redesigned um, to meet a whole new graphic standard that was created by our community um, creative design group, excuse me, and five more will be happening in December. The website, of course, you've known about because I've reported twice to you in the past year about uh, what we have been doing to launch a whole new way to communicate. And uh, we are still working on a calendar module uh, that will um, be uh, coming online fairly soon. Some of the partnerships we're working on in 2022, in addition to all the ones we have, which include about um, 30 plus healthcare agencies and other um, cultural related um, partners, is that we are working with some sister city organizations with, within the two counties. The first one, of course, is right here in Oakland, our hometown, uh, working with the Fukuoka uh, Sister City Association. And we've already started with them a nature walk in April. And um, later this year in, Aug in August, the mayor of Fukuoka will be coming to visit Oakland. And we actually will be part of this, what you see at the bottom, this beautiful um, pa pastel uh, presentation that will be installed in Lake Merritt Garden area. Um, and it will have um, 
some hand-picked um, pebbles that were at uh, some of our parks that our naturalists put out for the children that are associated with the sister city. Those pebbles will be used in the actual uh, beautiful mosaic mural. So it really, really is a cross-section of representation of Oakland and includes our parks. Um, multicultural committee is something that is has been started for many years. We are re revamping it so that uh, it is bigger and that it also has um, more of a, a focus with goals associated with it as opposed to just talking. So that is something that um, Monaco is working on. Additionally, wellness and equity. Uh, this is where the fitness and the wellness programs that she has been working on will continue. Um, the connection with the United Nations will continue. And this year we're actually a, um, will be a co-presenter with a webinar on climate change and resilience, something that we have to talk to the deputy general manager about um, in, uh, in August uh, with the United Nations. Um, and then also, of course, we'll have the day of peace like always at Lake Chabot. Uh, this uh, additional uh, November, the Latina Center, which is from Richmond, long partner of the districts, um, has been working with us um, for many, many years, activating their interests in Point Pinole. They are going to be working in activating more interest in Crab Cove. So that's how these, these um, uh, relationships work. It's not just a one size fits all. It's not just if you happen to be from one area, you only go to that one area. It's a deep uh, involvement that is enriched based on the interests of the community that we're trying to serve. And then lastly, um, we are going to be working with um, the Lee family who were the initiators once upon a time, many, many years ago, 25 or 30 years ago, to help us install the ADA fishing dock at Temescal. Of course, that fishing dock has been replaced, but it is now our opportunity to reconnect with the Lee family and um, acknowledge them and um, again, serve the community um, going forward um, with the Lee family's acknowledgement on, uh, on the fishing dog. Lastly, with regard to this community relations is inclusion and belonging. This is more or less part of what our DEI interests are. Um, and so we are working on partnering with a variety of community-based organizations, specifically re related to the Afghan families in the Southern part of our district in uh, Fremont Union City. We're uh, expanding our focus partnering with a variety of um, educational facilities and programs, including the one that Jim O'Connor actually um, created at Merritt College to get uh, uh, interested um, parties uh, engaged in the work that we do. And so we will be continuing to develop those relationships and working with the Dawali uh, uh, programs and the Dia de los Muertos programs to, again, uh, work in terms of our wellness and fitness programs. And then finally, um, again, this is Mona Co, and she's kind of that go-getter, is working on storytelling circles. And that is really what these uh, inclusion and belonging <clears throat> opportunities are all about, is not just coming to a park and using it as everybody else does, but really building an audience that is based on their storytelling interests. And so working with the staff through education and interpretation to help the communities uh, communicate within the interests that they have of the park. Uh, the second unit I'm gonna to address today is archives and history. This is our newest formalized department. Thank you very much to, um, Putting a uh, providing a position for us. That's, this is Brenda Montano's expertise. You can see the, the core areas that she's engaged in, the visibility and accessibility um, of putting uh, all of our archives online. She is 50% uh, completed with that project, wow. um, which is phenomenal in such a short period of time. She is also working with um, uh, con developing this constructed, constructed searchable oral history master list, um, which she's 65% complete in. 
um, and presenting that to the archive staff advisory group. That is a new group that she has put together since the uh, creation of her position to get uh, input through a variety of divisions to talk about who really does need to be on that master uh, list for oral histories. And again, then doing some actual oral history engagement um, through um, uh, our website and posting uh, a variety of thematic stories. There she's working very hard and she's about 10% complete. She is working um, really a solo uh, act down there, I must say. She's got a couple of contracts that assist her in certain areas, but she's really a solo act. So all of these things that are before you, she has really implemented on her own um, and fulfilled through um, years of uh, support through some volunteer activities. And um, so she is working on just developing and establishing the actual policies of what it should be for our collection of historic uh, recognition um, um, pro um, properties that are found and or left in park offices and in within the parks. She's uh, also looking at working with rehousing uh, specific uh, categories uh, at the Third Bid Marshall um, location, one of the bunkers which she's already got started. So that's exciting for her and that's an ongoing. Um, the uh, sustainability aspect in term, terms of storage, she it's an ongoing discussion. We really have no space to uh, even get around in a safe way as you probably have seen. That is one of the biggest challenges of this program. We need a physical location that will be safe and accessible to the public and uh, also a place that can transfer the Black Diamond Mines digital records that are out again in the park at Black Diamond, not in a very suitable location and in a suitable storage unit. Um, she is working with uh, the, the IS Department for Digital Preservation and will be working with the legal department on records retention. Um, Oral histories, um, she, we have contracted with UN, the uh, UC Berkeley Oral History Center to produce all of our or, oral histories. The benefit of that is to uh, not only have ac experts who are oral, oral history, um, um, people that uh, do this work on a regular basis, but they will be housed at UC Berkeley, which is very important for us for public access to. So we, we are looking at for this year, uh, 15 to be completed and we're about 40% completed at this point in time. Um, and um, you can see the ongoing aspects of what we're doing. Uh, we're, we're partnering with UC Berkeley students, uh, grad students to provide them activities for our benefit. And uh, certainly, it's been a very positive experience for everybody. It's an annual program that is being conducted uh, jointly. On the right, you can see the signature programs. This is of course not, has really not much to do with archives and history, but um, it is the only place in the public affairs division where we um, have an expert in event planning and that is Brenda Montano. So you can see the rest of the year looks like a um, signature program at Botanic Garden, uh, Shadow Cliffs Pavilion ribbon cutting, uh, Sinol Visitor Center create uh, completion and reopening, Tyler Ranch staging area sometime in the fall dedication, and uh, to celebration of Olmsted's 200th birthday through an event uh, that will be hopefully at our Tilden EEC uh, sometime in September. The public information campaigns that we work on in public affairs um, are, excuse me, let me go back. Public information campaigns um, are ongoing, but there is some nuance to that. Um, we basically with public information is about education and storytelling. Um, it's about informing our 3 million constituents in the two counties about who we are, what we do, what is there to do, 
and if there are any uh, threats such as fire, um, or there is some opportunities to just learn uh, and be educated about the, the interests that um, are from our actual park lands or the people that run them. Social media is a very significantly growing part of the public information program, and that is one of our significant challenges is trying to keep up with that. Um, as a, just a, an update, with our, we, we operate Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, TikTok, which is kind of a new one. That's the new hip one that some of the naturalists want to do, and Instagram. And all told, we have an average of about 11,000 impressions per post. And we are posting all the time through 25 social media administrators in the organization. Um, we certainly can't do it through one individual, so we have to work throughout the whole organization. And we have 25 individuals that represent all different divisions that are um, they're, uh, trained on um, how to post, what to post, and what our guidelines are. Um, some of our special public information programs this year we're working on that you've heard about before include the trail user education, and that will also fall into the category of the pilot planning project at Brioni's. You can see some on the slide of what some of the um, graphic design looks like. Wildfire safety is another one that we do uh, annually, but we change it up annually with uh, a lot of deep dive into what the park district is doing. Our dog education, which is our pup pro, uh, what to do around cattle. All of these are issues that we have heard from our constituents are important to them. Domestic cats in parks is a new one, of course, and we're partnering with the animal shelters to help us share that message as well. And then the most recent one has to do with parks being busy, that there are just some parks that are overwhelmed with park uh, users, some that are so difficult to find parking in, we, we really want to tell people, you know, there's other options. So we're starting an actual campaign to do that, that is directly related to working with operations. And um, we'll be uh, looking at the analysis later this year to see if things have changed, have certain parks gotten more visitation and others less, we'll have to see. Our media relations is a significant part of public information and Dave Mason, uh, our public information supervisor does a beautiful job of managing this day in and day out. And it results in a, a, an exquisite amount of um, earned, what we call earned media or free media, media that people write about us uh, in every type of uh, publication, radio, broadcast, magazines that we don't pay for. Largely, um, they are positive uh, acknowledgements on occasion. On occasion, they are somewhat controversial and that's when our issues management kicks in. And our issues management is basically managing the topic with expert messaging, um, training of all the people that are involved in the actual uh, uh, topic, and then um, measuring uh, or communicating externally and internally, and then measuring how successful that is. Uh, the information team also is responsible for the ambassador program, a huge undertaking with a very small staff. Um, and this year it's uh, coming back to life, but coming back to life slowly because uh, we still have limitations within the communities that we serve with regard to events. But that is a great opportunity in the future for a uh, robust um, inflection of more people that can volunteer their time to uh, represent us in the community. 
<clears throat> Creative Design Group is located in Pleasanton. I will tell you right off the bat, one of the biggest challenges we have with that group is that we, there's been a significant growth of signage in the parks, and I'm sure that you've all seen it. And uh, we, once upon a time, 20 years ago, when I first started here, we produced about 10,000 signs a year. Well, that number is far gone. And um, as of, I think, the first quarter of the year, we had already produced 5,000. And that's just with a very small um, group. But they do have access to the best uh, equipment, and uh, they are skilled uh, graphic uh, designers that work on everything that you can you can see and you can imagine, including uh, something that they're working on right now, addresses on all of the park buildings and facilities as a requirement for fire safety, so that if there is a fire in our in our parks and that there's facilities involved, they actually have an actual address. So um, the creative design group is also responsible for exhibit design. And this year they are bringing to fruition the Sinol Green Barn renovation, which has taken two years of planning and implementation to create a new experience out there in Sinol. DelVal kiosks, it's kind of phase two of the DelVal Visitor Center. That will be coming um, to fruition as well in the next coming couple of months. And those are re primarily responsible um, as opportunities to be on the patio at the visitor center in DelVal that will show a, a, a topographical model of the park, an interactive hike planner, and replicas of the fish at DelVal. So that installation should be happening in a few months. And then Shadow Cliffs, this is the um, interesting um, uh, funded private partnership with the foundation and a couple of very important um, personal and um, public funders that we have brought to the table. The Shadow Cliffs Pavilion will have get sculptural panels and tactile animal replicas to depict the natural environment. Oh recreation and human history will be shared and the Shadow Cliffs installation should be in this fall. One additional challenge is that this building that we are in is on a lease and it will expire in the next uh, 18 months. So that is something for the general manager to keep her eyes on. Rounding this up is the Regional Parks Foundation, one of the things dear to my heart because in the past 12 years of managing that foundation, we have had 11 consecutive years of growth um, and our portfolio has risen um, from uh, uh, about 3 million to now 15 is actually a typo, it's 19 million. I just looked at the uh, form 990 that will get filed with the IRS. <laughs> So that's exciting. Our membership is at an all time high and has really not ever um, waned too much, even during COVID. There were some times that we weren't getting immediate uh, responses from uh, people who have been members, but it's really rebounded as you can, you can see. Um, we just two days ago uh, provided the million dollar pass through for the renovation of Robert's pool. And upcoming changes in the foundation not only include a new executive director um, tied to the, the AGM position, but also um, so some system upgrades that are absolutely necessary. This is the back end. Nobody ever sees it, but it makes things efficient and effective for our staff to manage a growing portfolio of private funded uh, activities. And uh, we are launching corporate membership programs. We have um, provided uh, free memberships to a variety of agencies on behalf of our DEI initiative to get park memberships in the hands of people who don't have access in the communities of color that, rep that are th throughout the park district. Um, and I'll end lastly with um, some of the risks or challenges to the foundation going forward is um, includes um, fee structures. If we, as the park district, are to make any fee structure changes, 
you have to know that that will impact membership because membership is based on fees and the fees having to do with um, swim facilities, parking uh, and dog fees and other things like that. So that's important to be acknowledged um, and will and, and our membership program is our number one undesignated revenue fund. Um, additional uh, challenges that we need more data relevant to who EBRPD is serving. We've heard that um, discussed today through operations and I'm glad to see that's online to move forward. Um, if, the, uh, if the foundation does move off site, which because there's just not enough room in this building, that's another cost uh, to be considered, whether it's paid for by the district or the foundation, it is something to, to consider another up, up cost. We need to continue a close administrative and elected relationship, which I feel very supported on um, in recent conversations with many of you. Um, the staffing structure issue of the park district paying half and we paying half potentially in the future could be convoluted and problematic in terms of uh, whether or not if we um, continue that structure, um, if we choose not to continue that structure, will the existing staff stay? Kind of big topics. And then lastly, but really most importantly, I think to us, we raise more and more money every year. We pass more and more money to the, to the district every year. We can do as much as we possibly can, but we are limited by one thing, and that is the capacity of the, ex the staff in the regional parks that can provide the programming or provide the planning expertise and other things that we might be funding. So I've talked to Jim about this many, many times. We've actually funded uh, a pilot initiative to give him more staffing um, with us paying for half of it. And it's just something to think about in the future with respect to if the foundation is a significant partner to the district through private funding and stakeholders, important corporate stakeholders, um, we're going to have to find a way to uh, leverage how the capacity um, can, uh, can help out. And, and I understand that it's uh, very challenging. We all have staffing issues, but that is one from a risk assessment perspective. But I'm happy and pleased to be here to be able to share with you. These are all the things in 2022 that's happening. And 2023, I'm sure, will be just fantastic with new leadership. So I'm happy to answer questions. And that's my, my presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Thank you're good. You. Beverly? <laughs> Well, um, I definitely want to see this list <laughs> because you went you went through it pretty fast, and I I, I think it's just astonishing what public affairs manages uh, to do. And and you didn't even really talk about regional in nature. Oh, I didn't. And how long it takes to to put that together with everybody? People seem to have their own opinions, <laughs> right? on it and um and that's our main you know print vehicle for those people who read print still um so thank you so much for this summary of everything that happens and um you got some you have some staff here did i see dave dave is here around the corner our expert um mr everything i just i really appreciate uh how hard everybody works to make this happen and, and um, the messaging that you've helped to put together that, that makes us look good. So thank you so much, Carol. You're, you're very welcome, thank you. It's a great time to be active in the ambassador program because you know people are uh, very affectionate toward us these days. They're, uh, all, all, the, all your efforts, uh, manifest themselves in, in when you're out among just a random group of the public who come and visit and want to talk to you and uh, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a good it's a good time for doing those tabling gigs and did one Saturday we're going to do another one this Saturday 
I tell staff that it's the best feel good opportunity. Absolutely. <laughs> for the public to tell you how fantastic you are and what work uh, we're, we're doing on their behalf to have this beautiful land accessible. Good. Carol, thank you uh, uh, for everything you've done and, and including this presentation. Um, just to see in one presentation how much um, work is done. I mean, it's, it's all it's true with all the all the other departments as well. But it seems like you have um, uh, tremendous seen tremendous growth and overseen tremendous growth in all the, in all your departments. And uh, my hats off to to your um, to your 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 folks there, in Mona Cove and uh, Brenda Montano. Who seem to their job seems to increase uh, exponentially every year, and I'm surprised they're they haven't dropped you know <laughs> dropped dead from exhaustion, <laughs> but uh, clearly um, uh, their efforts have uh, really um, benefited the park district and also benefit our community, and uh, I hope. Uh, we can find some way to uh, to give them some help. Uh, just like with all of our other departments, where this pandemic has really shown us how short we are, how short staffed we are, and um, and staffing is the biggest issues. And uh, it's amazing what um, your folks have done with what with the, what little they've had, and uh, and uh, your your work on the uh, Regional Parks Foundation. Uh, I congratulate the the. Board members there, they are, uh, they are tuned in and they want the best. Um, and especially the, around their efforts around the DEI, uh, I love participating on that, uh, that, that subcommittee. And so um, my only question is, because uh, I was approached by this just recently, um, how, um, I think it sounds like we need to look more at how we uh, uh, address uh, people that have, are uh, uh, visually challenged, and uh, it, 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 from the feedback I got from this one constituent, uh, it was like it's it's doesn't it's not quite up to snuff as far as uh, for the for those folks that they can't see, and um, so we, I'm hoping yes, that you, there's something that we can do to uh, to address that. You're, you're right, um, Director um, um, Rosario, that the ADA component of uh, people with um, access issues, disabilities, um, sight or uh, physical limitations is important for us to, as an agency, address. Um, and so we're doing it in the small ways that we can through our website, but also through our exhibit team um, with the exhibits going forward or the new exhibits. Um, we've been uh, working on those types of accessible changes. But frankly, what we need to do now is go back and up update all of the other um, types of uh, projects and um, programs and um, um, signage things of that sort that are already out there. So we're, it's, it's, it's always trying to keep up, but going backwards. It's kind of a rolling <laughs> scenario. Yes, that's very important. And I have to give great kudos to Mona Co because she's really taking a very personal interest in ensuring that that is a major part of her uh, annual um, outreach. It's, it's cultural outreach um, and it's, uh, outreach to people that really truly ha don't have the same access for whatever reason. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Anne. You know, you have such a terrific staff, but you've been such a great leader. I have so much enjoyed every time I go out. It's been a while since I've been out with Mona because I have never seen such a small person who has so much energy and does so much with such diverse clientele. You know, everybody has fun when you're out there on that trail with Mona. 
She is just terrific. But all your staff are good. Even when they're hidden away, looking at artifacts from the past. So congratulations on pulling it together. And you know what I think about foundation. It has just grown beautifully. And I think we're so lucky to have had you leadership in getting us to that point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Director Wieskamp. And my entire staff, as I said the other day, <laughs> truly are remarkable. Um, it's been very easy to actually oversee all of these projects because their investment is just so personal and right. deep seated and deep rooted. Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation. Carol. Oh, Dennis. Carol, I just, I just wanted to get a word in edgewise. Thank you so much for your remarkable career here. Thank you so much for your presentation and what you've done for this foundation and your, your division. I, I, I recall I was talking with Dee about this before when I came to this district. There were two people in the public affairs department, Monty Monteagle, who was an old newspaper reporter who would write a couple articles every once in a while, press releases, and a guy named Elwood Max Lee, who took photographs. <laughs> Much better names than you guys have in your staff, but what you've done, taking it from that to what it is now is, is remarkable, and, and, and I truly thank you for that. And I, it, it must have been wonderful and a lot of fun to do that because it, it sure shows every Every, everything you do seems to come out really, really good. Go ahead, Ellen. I would just say thank you very much, Carol, for all the work that you've done and the things that we've learned from you. And, you know, appreciate you really making the Park District look good and, uh, you know, getting people to be, really want to be part of the work that you did. So thank you so much. And we will miss you. But hopefully we'll still see you from time to time as well. <laughs> thank you. Uh Definitely be around. Thank you. Okay. Wanna move ahead? Thanks, Carol. All right. What is your pleasure? <laughs> we have HR who's ready to go. And we also were good. We were going to do a very quick, I mean, and I mean five minute preview for the July 22nd, but we can also skip that. Um, so really, let's, it's up to the board and what. What's the pleasure? Like to do. Go, go to uh, HR. Uh, can I just ask a question? Yes, Ellen. Since the meeting was scheduled to be done by four, some of us may have things we are, are, are supposed to be doing at about that time. Are, is this something that we could continue to another meeting by any chance? Uh, who, who has a hard uh, deadline of uh, four o'clock? Because we're not going to make that. <laughs> Mine kind of is, but I also don't want to miss stuff. So that's why I'm hoping maybe there's a, an option of doing the rest at another time. But I'm just asking. All right. Kind of hard right through. You do? I don't mean. Because I'm concerned about our own um, discussions. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. I that's right. We're going to want to talk to. So there's two two of us have a hard deadline. I, ha I have a four thirty stop. I have another meeting at four thirty. And we will never be done with all of us by four thirty. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the only, you know us well, Ellen. The only way we'll be able to do this is if we go to our lists. At this point, okay. So yeah. we'll have to defer those two items. Mm -hmm. and swing around to our list. Well, we still won't be done by four. Or 4.30. Okay, that's a good idea. Uh, we'll start with those who may have to leave early. So, Ellen, you want to go first, then Elizabeth? And I, then Dennis. I, 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 I really don't want to go first or last because I won't be able to get my stuff done by the time I have to leave. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I'm not sure what to do because, you know, I think it's really important that we hear each other's priorities. So I, it's not just about. You know, we'll have probably even more thoughtful things to say after we've had time to think over what we've just been through here, all we've listened to. Personally, I think it's been so great for the first time to hear from our staff what their concerns are, what 
they're excited about and all the rest of it. But I don't, we're all good at thinking and talking. I think we can do it later and it'll be fine. I don't have anything immediately, but I think some people do have things they'd like to do, but I do think we need to hear each other. Okay, well, I'm just gonna get, get us going. And if people have to leave, they leave. But I don't see that we want to put off our own uh, presentations uh, even later in the year than we already have. But what if we're not able to do our presentations today? Well, or then, then we'll have to do it uh, over again, I suppose. Any suggestions from staff? <clears throat> Um, we, what we could do is go ahead and just do the HR presentation so that we're, you have all of that information and yeah. then we could, um, go ahead and take the first part of the meeting on the, on July 22nd to have you go through your lists and we'll, then we'll focus on the capital improvement program. And then we can always circle back to you, um, in August um, with, uh, some of the feedback on the priorities, if that, if that works for you, president coffee. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I think that's a good idea. We're it's, it's not January right now. So to delay, delay ours until the July okay, 22nd. So we'll cut ourselves out of this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I think that's back, very good. And defer back to you to okay. uh, finish the presentations. Okay, that'd be great. We can just get give you all the information. So we'll go ahead and get to HR. And then if you, if those of you, if some of you are able to stay for five more minutes after that, I would love to have Lisa be able to do a little preview for the July meeting. Yeah, and I, she think will, should, and so that, I think we should. So just to kind of tee, tee up that conversation. That's, um, that's, that's, that's terrific, we'll, folks. <laughs> We'll, we'll be done for 30 total. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> President Coffey, members of the board, um, I'm very pleased to present HR's priorities for 2022 and 2023. This is just a snapshot of some of them. I would also like to highlight that these are HR's priorities, but as you've heard, there is overlap with every division here that has their own priorities that HR needs to make sure that we are meeting because we need to partner with them and we do provide important internal service, not only for our employees, but for management. So this is just a brief introduction. The first one is growing human resources. We've been very fortunate to have your support um, and commitment to growing HR. Right now we stand at 19 employees. Um, I am very, very proud of this team. Um, as Christina highlighted, it's not just about filling a vacancy, filling a seat. It's about retaining staff and retaining your team. I'm really committed to cultivating these employees um, and making them the best um, and encouraging them to grow um, and train and develop their skills. And so that is my main priority because if they are happy and they are satisfied in their job, that means they're only going to provide better service to our employees and um, our managers and management. So um, we have three vacancies right now. We are close to filling one um, and perhaps two by the end of the summer. So we are very hopeful to be fully staffed by the fall. The second commitment and priority is recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce of excellence. 
You hear us talk about that a lot, but what does that mean? What are the actions we're taking to do that? Because words are hollow. It's really the action that means something, um, especially to our employees that are looking to us um, to see diversity and to see a workforce of excellence. So here are just a few things that we are doing. Um, we presented this, I think, in the beginning of May, and I have updated data, which is really important because HR is rooted in data. Um, I really find data important to tell our story, to see where we're missing the mark, where we can improve, and where we're doing a good job. So we have 925 budgeted FTEs, as we've said before. Um, in five years, we've added 102 FTEs. That's amazing growth for the Park District. In one year, we have hired, HR has hired and onboarded and, and other divisions, 123 newly hired employees. That does not include seasonals. I just got the seasonal numbers in one year. We have hired and onboarded over 280 seasonal employees in one year. So that's a huge number um, of employees that we are bringing on. Um, and it's not through the effort of our recruitment team who is dedicated in trying to fill every vacancy that we have. Our turnover rate remains steady at about 8.5%. That's our voluntary turnover rate. Our vacancy rate continues to hover at approximately 9%. Right now it's about 9.25%. Um, we have about 88 vacancies right now. I would like to highlight that that 9%, though it seems high, is a very good number. Um, in May, we presented that the national average for public agencies is approximately 20 to 21%. So we're well below that number. Um, also, as a point of reference, one of our neighboring agencies, vacancy rate is closer to 18%, with some departments hovering around 50% vacancy rate, which is huge. So even though recruiting is difficult, retaining employees is difficult, I would like to think that the Park District is doing a really good job in keeping that number steady at around 9%. Of course, we can improve that, um, but having that steady number even through the pandemic is, is a nice factor, uh, is, a, is a nice number to see. And most of our hires have been ASME represented um, positions at 72% with the PA being 18%. So they're a large majority of the employees that we are bringing on board, um, which is important. We have also rolled out NeoGov. NeoGov is one of the largest software platforms that public agencies use for recruitment purposes. Um, we now use it, we rolled it out last summer. It allows all requests to fill to be submitted electronically no more paper, no more actual physical paper that we have to sign. The approvals are routed by automated approval workflows. So you can go into NeoGov and see where your request to fill is stalled or where it may be held up. And, and it allows us to really track and be efficient in our recruitments. Um, it also allows candidates online self-scheduling and automated notifications. So that allows our candidates the flexibility to schedule their own interview. And then they get notifications and updates throughout the process, which is really important to show our, our, our potential employees um, that we communicate with them timely. There's nothing worse than applying for a job and hearing nothing for months and months and months. And NeoGov really helps eliminate that. It's not perfect. Um, but it does a really good job in allowing HR to stay on top of that. NeoGov, which I'm very proud to say, um, helps with fairness and consistency in the recruitment process. NeoGov allows us to redact names and addresses and other identifying information during the applicant screening by HR analysts. So the HR analysts, when they are screening applications, will not see that information, which at times can show implicit bias um, when you're screening. Um, it also allows us to monitor diversity of applicants for targeting advertisement during open recruitment. So we can really get that data to see, are we obtaining a diverse pool of candidates? Where could we do better? What advertising avenues allow us to get diverse applicant pools? 
And so NeoGov does a really good job of giving us that data that allows all of us to do our job and do it better. It also has better metrics and reporting and tracking of recruitment process. It allows even me, <laughs> once I learned how, once I learned how to go in and really see the status of recruitment. So if I have an AGM contact me concerned about the status of a recruitment, I can go in real time and have that discussion with them. So NeoGov has been a, a huge asset to HR. Um, and I'm really proud that we were able to get that up and running. And we continue to look at NeoGov as to how it can help us recruit and retain. For example, we are looking at it for the onboarding process. Remember, we have new employee orientation, and then we have the onboarding process, which is the forms and the policy review. And so that's the next phase of NeoGov that we're really focusing on, because that's what employees are expecting. They're expecting, even though we want in-person, they're expecting that online ability to fill out those forms easily. So that's the next phase of what we're doing. Um, and new employee orientation, we um, highlighted that in the beginning of May. Um, this is not the forms, this is a warm welcome to the park district. You learn the history, the mission and the values of the park district from park district employees. This is not an HR event, this is a park district event with participation by all of our AGMs, by many of our managers, and it is not a one-time thing. It is an ongoing commitment. They take time out of their day um, to make sure that our new employees feel welcomed. And it's, it's a huge accomplishment for the entire park district, because as we presented in May, the statistics show that employees that have a positive new employee orientation are more likely to stay. Um, so our first new employee orientation was May 25th, 2022. It was a huge success. Here are some photos. Mike's the highlight of our new employee orientation, as you can see, um, but it was very well received. We have another one next week. Um, so we're still trying to capture those employees that were hired during the pandemic to make sure that they go first while also um, folding in our new hires because we wanna make sure everybody attends. It is important that employees understand this is a mandatory event, not because we wanna to torture them, but because we wanna get them excited about the work they're going to do. So as I stated before, new employee orientation leads to higher job satisfaction. It leads to commitment in the organization's values and mission, lower turnover, higher performance levels, career effectiveness, and lowered stress. So this is a, a collective effort to really bring our employees on board. Another priority is the ADA interactive process. This is something very close to my heart, something that I'm very committed to. Um, when I started here, the ADA interactive process was split between human resources and risk. Um, one handled industrial injury ADA accommodations while HR handled non-industrial. And Carol Victor, and now Lynn, um, we've worked together to transition that work to human resources to handle all of that work going forward. And in May, I introduced you to July, who is our senior HR analyst. She comes from Berkeley, having extreme expertise and just a great personality to handle this type of work. Not everybody can do this type of work. It takes a special person um, to be able to engage our employees while also establishing relationships with management because they have to be part of the process. So that is an ongoing commitment that we have. It hasn't completely transferred over to human resources, but I anticipate by the end of the year, it will be completely within human resources. Workers' compensation is still in risk. So we work very, very closely with risk. And I like to think we have a very good relationship with Alma and her team because we have to have that open communication to make sure this process works. The other item that we're working on is our workplace accommodation policy. Um, we just noticed our unions on it earlier this week. It's a policy that sets forth the ADA process at the park district. Um, it's the first policy the park district has ever had. And it's really important that our employees, our applicants um, understand that we are a welcoming agency, not just for, you know, based on gender or diversity, but also based on disability. So I'm very proud of that policy. We still need to go through the meet and confer process. So that may take some time, but I anticipate again by fall, we will have a policy in place. 
Um, again, a very positive development for our employees. Um, another item is looking ahead performance appraisal management in Summit. We talked a little bit about this in May also. Summit is our training program. It has a catalog of thousands and thousands of trainings that our employees take advantage of every day. We're very lucky to have this program um, because it automates training and allows us to really cultivate um, our workforce and, and to allow them to hopefully move forward in their careers through this training. We hope as um, Jim O'Connor mentioned to implement some safety training that will also be part of Summit to really identify uh, mandatory trainings, safety trainings that our employees need to go through every year, in addition to some perhaps discretionary trainings that employees may want to go through. So that's a work in progress. Um, the performance appraisal management system we hope to have in place by January of next year. This is a huge lift for our training division because um, our performance appraisal rate is not good <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, it dropped off significantly. I want to say we had about a 20% return on performance appraisals. And that not only is, is not good for management, but it also hinders our employees' ability to better themselves um, in their performance. So this summit through performance appraisal management will allow employees and managers to track in real time when a performance appraisal is due managers will be able to see who has a performance appraisal and who needs one. So there will be more accountability on managers and supervisors for getting them done because performance feedback shouldn't be done just once a year. It should be done on a daily basis, but the formal performance appraisal is needed so that employees know what they need to work on, what they're doing well, um, in addition to having work plans. So we are hoping that this will, will roll this out sometime in January, February for the next performance appraisal season, which starts at the first of next year. Another ongoing commitment um, for human resources is labor relations. Um, it's very important to me that we have a very good relationship with our unions, both AFSCME and the Police Association. Um, we have a mutual interest in making this a great place to work and we really need to partner together. Most of my work and everything I need to do through HR involves the unions. And if they don't trust HR, if they don't trust me, it's very difficult to get anything done. And so I'm very grateful for them, for their, their willingness to work with me. I've been here a year, um, but that relationship is something that is a priority for me. And it also is, is, you know, an example of how, you know, other managers will hope to partner with our, our unions. Um, so that is something that's very, very important. Um, speaking of the police association, this is another item that we're working on. Contract negotiations with the police association, their contract expires September 30th. Um, we've already met with the union two times. Um, to discuss the class and comp study that is required um, in the MOU. And we have finished those meetings. So the park district is proceeding with a class and comp study. We plan on sitting down with the union as required by the MOU in August. We have an outside chief negotiator um, that is working currently with public safety and the chief um, on priorities for proposals. And of course we will be coming back to closed session to get board input on those items too. So that's um, coming in about probably closed session starting in July with negotiations starting in August. And finally, policy development and updates. This is another important item um, that again involves our unions. Um, I already talked about the workplace accommodation policy, but I'm also updating the anti-discrimination and harassment policy that's known as HR 18. There are updates that are ready to be noticed to the union. We have a code of conduct policy. That is really important. We currently do not have a code of conduct anti-bullying policy. We have limited provisions in the PAM, um, but this is gonna be a first of its kind code of conduct policy that really sets the standard. Policies are important because it sets forth the park district's values. And so without a policy, employees are left to wonder what behavior is accepted and not accepted and what rights they have. 
The FMLA CIFRA policy, that's protected leave. We're also updating that. The military leave, that's a new policy. We currently do not have a policy that sets forth employees' right to military leave um, during non-war time. So we're working on that. The lactation policy, we are updating that. We have done industrial disability retirement guidelines, what we call IDR guidelines. Those are currently completed. Acting assignment guidelines, we are working on that too. As you know, our MOU, especially with AFSCME, has rules and regulations regarding acting assignments. So we wanna make sure managers and supervisors understand those obligations in addition to understanding the importance of acting, which again, grows our own. And one thing that's not listed here is the PAM revision project that HR and the general manager's office is spearheading. Um, the PAM needs updating um, and it needs some separate policies. So that is something that HR and the general manager's office is working on. And all of these require union involvement and union participation. So even though I'd like to snap my fingers and have all of these policies in place by next week, that's impossible, both for staff and for the union. So it's a work in progress. And I have to remind myself I need to be patient because it's important work. And that's it. Wow. Any questions or comments? Dennis? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Allison. A lot of work, lots of great stuff you're doing. Um, and I hate to pile on, but I, I sort of, I'm, I'm interested in a return to work policy or a light duty policy. I think that's value to the district. I don't know if you're working on it. I, you may have mentioned it. I'm getting a little blurry eyed no. here, but you don't have to answer me now, but I, I'm really interested in that, moving ahead with that if we could, or, or investigating it. Uh, I'm also really high on internships. Uh, I had the ability to get interns that did incredibly valuable work that wouldn't have been done by my employees. Uh, I, I think they, they're a real asset to the park district. And of course, I say it all the time, apprenticeships. I think it's a real, real good opportunity and, and it makes your job easier, I think. Just brief comments with respect to return to work and light duty and temporary modified duty. That's part of the workplace accommodation policy that we just noticed our unions on. So that is complete, um, especially once we complete the meet and confer process. Um, the internship program, thanks to Jim's persistence, um, we are revamping that project. That's not listed, but we are going to exec staff to roll it out. So that should be up and running very, very shortly, probably by July because we understand the need. And I've heard you on the apprenticeships. I think President Coffey has also raised that issue. So it's in my notes to meet with the Chief of Workforce Development on, so thank you. Alan? I just wanted to say, um, thank you very much. Quite, quite impressive, uh, the work that you've done since you came to work with us. And um, just so pre appreciate uh, the quality and the additional um, ways of organizing the work that is done in your department. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Dee? Yeah, thank you, Allison. Um, uh, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> um, I'm very impressed with, with your work since you've been here. And, uh, and I just wanna congratulate you on uh, uh, filling out your staff. I'm really excited about HR being fully staffed and being able to fully function and uh, watching you build your team. And um, uh, really impressed, I think just a couple of months ago, I think our vacancy, we had 200 and now we're down to 88. The 200 includes, included seasonals. Okay. So we're, we're hovering about the same number with budgeted FTEs. So I would like to take credit for that, but <laughs> it, was, it included seasonals. And you're truthful too, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so a uh, question about uh, all these uh, policies that are either updated or actually the, even the, the new ones that are being proposed, at what point do they come before the board of directors at all? Um, so some of the policies will and some will not. It just depends on the content and the topic of the policy. Okay. Because yeah, I'm, I'm always, um, a lot of time we're the policymakers, and then sometimes we'll hear from 2428 saying that, well, it's a policy and it's, is it board approved, blah, blah, blah. So I um, uh, just wanted to make that a clarification. 
uh, which which ones come before us and which ones don't. Yes, and a, a lot of HR policies are administrative policies, so it's it's different from the pol important policy work that that you do. Um, but for an example of a policy that went before you was the California Supplemental Paid Sick Leave for COVID, because that was a ben an item of benefit that is within your purview, and that came in fall in addition to the to the you know the extensions that you graciously agreed to all last year. So it really does depend on that. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, uh, as far as, uh, there's always been a, a thinking about training for employees. And I'm spe specifically um, in the past for employees in the field, it's really difficult sometimes for employees in the field to uh, even get approvals sometimes for, for to attend trainings outside of the park district. Uh, I mean, we have a great we have great resources here inside the district, but there's there's always opportunities outside, and it's always seems to me like it's very difficult for our employees, especially the park rangers, to get training approved outside to go outside the district for training. So, uh, some of that is is uh, financial. I mean, some I know uh, when I was a park supervisor, some of my staff I would like, I wanted them to go to outside training, but they just didn't have the finances to do it, uh, you know, put out the money up front and then wait for a check from the park district later. So uh, there's some way to look at that, make it easier. And then, um, and then my last thing is, uh, what was it? Did I write it down? <laughs> I didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Uh, oh, regarding NeoGov. Uh, how, how easy is it to fill out? I mean, can someone do it on their phone? Because I, I, I've seen people, um, but some people just don't have computers. So that's a very good point um, and something that we are monitoring through the data that we're receiving through NeoGov because we are very cognizant of the fact that some of the targeted applicants that we're seeking may not have internet access. They may not have access to a computer. So we are really monitoring that um, to see if there has any impact on the, the diversity of, of the can, the pool list that we're, the, the interested candidates that we're getting. So it is very user-friendly. Um, it is very easy to fill out an application and respond to the questions. But again, if you don't have access, it, you just don't have the ability to fill it out. So that is something we're monitoring and whether we need to make paper applications or paper, paper processes that we can then upload into our own databases when we go to career fairs or things like that. Yeah, um, well, good. And then are, is, it, is NeoGov multilingual? That's and a good question. I don't know that answer. I will look into that. Because I know, um, I mean, every time, I've worked down around my house or my neighbors, and I see um, a lot of people of color doing a lot of really good work. And I always approach them. And of course, their bosses always hate me because I'm trying to push the park district, you know. But, uh, and they're, you know, they don't, English is not their primary language. So um, I just wanted to make sure that that's an opportunity um, because there's a lot of talented people out there. And uh, we're not, I don't, I don't think we're being able, we're getting, we're getting those, we're hitting those demographics. So anything we can do to, to get um, good people out here to work and people who are willing to work hard and, and uh, I'd like to see that. So thank you. That's it, but uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Any others? Beverly? Um, thank you very much, Allison. It's really interesting. Um, and I'm glad you're data driven too. And, and, um, but I was very interested in uh, your updating of the policies. I was very up interested in your updating the policies. And um, uh, as I have said before, I do think that something like this uh, should come to the executive committee. Um, doesn't necessarily come to the need to come to the entire board, but um, I think there are things that could be discussed in, in that setting that would be constructive um, for HR and informative for the boards for the board. And thank you for your 
your comments always always interesting to hear those. So thank you. Dan. I'd like to say, keep it very simple. I think you've done a tremendous job. You've gathered a great staff and they seem to be doing an excellent job. So congratulations. Okay, uh, anyone? Yes, Elizabeth. Yeah, likewise. I, I, I mean, all I can say is, wow, <laughs> you know, really, you have covered a lot of ground since you've been here. And it's, it really is astounding work. This is not easy work to do, you know, these kinds of structural changes and policy changes and, and, and for that matter, hiring people um, is, is you know, really, it's, it's very impressive. And I'm just so happy you're here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think that's that's good. So we have uh, one presentation left, Lisa. Then we do have a public comment and then we will uh, adjourn after that. My apologies, I have to leave, I've got an appointment. Thank you, Ann. It's been really good. Um, sorry. Sorry about this. Okay, here we go. There we go. All right, uh, good afternoon. Lisa Baldinger, Legislative and Policy Management Analyst. And I'll be giving just a pretty swift overview of what's to come for the Capital Improvement Program. And as you can see, this is definitely a team effort. So I wanna thank the General Manager for her leadership, as well as AGM Christina Kelchner, AGM Deborah Ocker, and Chief of Design and Construction, Lisa Gorgian. So I'm gonna start with the why. So what is the purpose of a prioritizing capital projects? And so as you've seen in the document that was presented before you today, the park district has numerous capital projects moving forward. And we only have so much staff capacity to move that forward, only so much budget. And we also wanna stay aware of sort of what's all on the horizon. And so our goal is to use this capital uh, prioritization matrix to help guide the park district's decisions about which capital projects uh, will be considered for advancement and integration into a capital improvement program. So ultimately what we would like to have a larger five-year program and this is just sort of that initial foundational work to get there. And then the how, so how are we gonna go about laying that foundation? And so staff is proposing developing a capital project prioritization matrix it's something that we want to be uh, approved by the board of directors and used to evaluate and prioritize capital projects for advancement and integration into a future capital program. And then just for the purpose of discussion on your screen, you can see that we do have a definition of a capital project. So the park district, we do a variety of programs and other elements. And so we're defining a capital project as a project which develops, improves and maintains a park district asset as defined by park district policy, this can include natural and built infrastructure, such as a visitor use facility, restoration, utilities, and trails. And so just for the board to know, staff has been uh, doing the lift to prepare for this discussion. So over the past six months, uh, we've had multiple meetings and engagement with AGMs, the general manager, with chiefs, managers, and project staff at all levels who contribute to the work of the capital project portfolio. We really want to be vetting this draft criteria that we're bringing before you today with everyone's voices and input, so that way we have uh, a good amount of background. Um, also, the initial draft criteria, though this is a new thing for East Bay Regional Park District, it's not new to sort of the public service industry. And so we we're able to pull from many cross-jurisdictional examples to provide us with a foundation for criteria and then sort of expand it using our vision, vision mission, and values uh, to really align with the park district's goals. Uh, we also did have questions in the community survey Eric and I spoke to earlier today related to the different elements of the criteria. We hope to have those cross tabs ready for the July discussion so we can really dive in together and see what folks say across the districts um, and understand 
Uh, we also do want to have input on this from our park advisory committee. And so we have a meeting planned uh, for July 28th. And then today is our first uh, point of contact on this with you all. And then we hope to dive in even deeper in July. And then again in August at a formal board meeting. So just at a very high level, sharing with you what we have so far, uh, we do have uh, 13 uh, criteria, uh, the first of which is mandatory. So staff did identify that there are projects that have legal, safety, regulatory, or other reasons that they need to advance. And we wanna right away identify, is a project mandatory or is it not? And if it is mandatory, we wanna have a discussion about advancing that because it shouldn't be held back because of the point system. And then to dive into the ones uh, that we do uh, wanna put some weighted criteria on, uh, the first one is equity, and this is one that we've been working closely with our GIS department, looking at different state definitions for underserved communities. And we have currently a draft uh, definition for both geographic equity as well as social equity. So geographic equity is looking at disadvantaged communities or um, underserved communities as defined through state definitions and looking at the census track and it relative to the park area. And then social equity is looking at where our programs are happening. So where are we taking census tracts that meet those underserved definitions and bringing them to the park. So an example being that a campground in Tilden maybe is used by a program from a census tract that meets that definition but isn't within. Uh, next up is our habitat and resource conservation criteria, really looking at the wildlife and, and uh, cultural resources in our parks. Continuing on, uh, we're proposing some criteria looking at public access, so not just new points of access, but expanding and maintaining existing access, and then also supporting growth of staff capacity to support increased access at parks. For climate preparedness, we're looking at it through both the lens of adaptation and mitigation. Um, so adaptation, looking at sea level rise and, and, and built infrastructure, natural built infrastructure. And then mitigation is looking at maybe a new trail that helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through commuter travel or other elements. Partnership is where we have our leveraging uh, other people's funding, but we're pairing it with also working with community groups on sort of an equal playing field. So whether a project has a community-based organization advancing it in partnership or is leveraging other folks funding, uh, we're proposing it or receive these points. All right, next up is operation efficiencies. And so this is looking at where maintenance projects are continuously happening, maybe a more permanent fix. Also looking at maybe the project results in a revenue generating outcome. For public and environmental health, this is the one that sort of captures everything uh, related to health and safety that didn't fall into that mandatory category. So something like uh, improving the windows of a facility with uh, so for, for poor air quality days, for smoke days, or other things like that. Multi-beneficial use is us aiming at approaching projects holistically. So rather than having a group of visitors feel that their park, their trail is constantly under construction, we want to have sort of taking in the holistic look at what infrastructure repairs, maintenance, uh, new development needs to be occurred there to help streamline project implementation uh, to improve service use and benefit. And then our final two definitions, and then we'll talk next steps and wrap up. We have maintaining and extending useful life of services so that it's uh, improving, renovating, or repair the infrastructure to extend the life. And then project readiness. So this is identifying projects that are within our master plan, adopted planning documents such as land use plans, or our voter commitment lists. And so these are the draft criteria that staff is proposing. We'll be bringing it back to you all at the board study session in July to do a little bit of a deeper dive, talk about how we plan to apply this criteria, how does something meet this criteria more specifically. I touched on a little bit today with the state definitions, but we'll go in even deeper. I also mentioned that we'll be bringing it before the Park Advisory Committee in late July for some additional public and stakeholder input. And then in August, we plan to bring it back uh, to a board of directors formal meeting uh, for discussion and possible adoption. And thank you. You're talking about possible adoption of the, these criteria. Correct. Interesting. I'll let others go first. I do have one question. <laughs> go ahead, Dee. I I think this is uh, I think it's fabulous. I think they have a uh, decision making matrix around um, um, CIP is 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 a great idea, and uh, of course I love the equity part, uh, and I I can't wait to see. Can't wait to see the, the plan. <laughs> Thank you. Well, 
I'll, I'll go. Do we include uh, raw, raw land as capital? Do we include uh, raw land acquisitions? With acquisition these? will not be included as part of this matrix. Okay, so acquisition will have its own set of criteria in the, independent of this. I'll turn to the GM. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone on the Zoom room? I'm there. No? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you, much, Lisa. Lisa. We'll turn next to public comment. We do have one public comment on this topic. We have a comment on the CIP. We can accept public comment on any of the topics we've had today. Okay. At this point. And that would be Kelly Abra. You have three. Okay, thank you. Um, the text notifications on my phone are uh, going crazy, beeping like crazy, because Kilcare, Kilcare Road and parts of Sinol are under fire evacuation. So we'll see how far that, uh, how big that Sinol fire gets. Um, looking for a word that uh, means a small police station. The word is Koban. There are 6,000 Koban in Japan. Um, here in Fremont, uh, and uh, well, one, one important lesson for public affairs and public relations people that they need to learn is not to call in police uh, when they are dealing with political opposition. Yeah, it's, it's a bad look. It creates um, um, everlasting um, uh, enmity. Uh, here in Fremont, our city council meetings, we, they don't have any scheduled uh, stop, stop time because there's no such thing as overtime for politicians. So scheduling a stop time is a big mistake um, uh, for this meeting or any meeting. <laughs> We're uh, always being told that parks are forever, but the span of control, which is a word, we, a phrase we've heard often today, is limited by the span of data and by the span of documented records. The district website was overhauled recently for prettiness, but it was actually stripped down to the bare minimum of public records required by law. Ford agendas only go back three and a half years as of right now. The district has digitally deleted the data and erased its in institutional memory of board actions and policy direction uh, policy decisions. Because of this self-directed in institutional amnesia, the, the metaphysical now is all we have left. Uh, Zen Buddhism, though, teaches us the importance of living in the present. And by that standard, this district has created a uh, Buddhist nirvana. This district is visioning for a future that is unknowable while its policy decisions and its budgetary past are lost in the mist of, mists of history. There are 55 act, active capital projects in the budget, uh, but we ha I haven't seen any uh, Gantt charts or milestones. Tomorrow's legislative meeting tells you how they, they operate over there in the legislation department has like 100 pages of detailed stuff. Today's meeting has like, what, two, three pages of, of, uh, of, of brief uh, bullet points. Um, and when, when we're talk, talking about training and employee development, that needs to be more, uh, it's, it's way too process oriented. Employ, employees think that if they do something, um, that, that they did something, they, they went through a process, that that's enough. They don't look at the results. So many times the things that they're doing are supposed to communicate ideas, concepts, safety uh, things into people's heads, the, the, the minds of the customers. They have uh, a lot of times people are, are lost in this process orientation. They don't think about what's going on in the minds of their customers. They don't even think of those people that walking through the parks as the customers. They think of them as the problem. Um, so uh, the, the liaison meetings, for example, another problem, in, at Fremont, they're filled with fluff. The most recent meeting was the most bland, banal, and uh, and least controversial uh, uh, thing in the uh, w the topic was the least controversial park in the district, uh, a historical park. That was the entire topic of the meeting. Meanwhile, there's I'm sure other things going on in Fremont that are uh, very controversial, but were deliberately left off the agenda. That's your time, uh, Kelly. All right, thank you very thank much. You. Um, Mr. Mitchell, are you um, speaking during public comment? I see your hand is raised. Yes, I would like to speak. Okay, you have three minutes, sir. Uh, hello, uh, President Coffey, Board of Directors, GM. Um, I am speaking uh, as a president of Ask Me 2428. Uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to speak kind of broadly over um, the presentations that we saw today. Uh, one of the things that I saw was that staffing remains a huge need throughout the park district. 
Um, although we've brought on a lot of staff, there still are a lot of existing vacancies. There's currently 64 ASME vacancies, um, 16 of which are park rangers for, uh, that were approved for this year's budget uh, that the division hasn't requested to fill um, at this point uh, over halfway through the year. Um, these are, you know, that is work that's, that's not been done um, throughout this year. And that puts additional pressure on um, our members and also our ability to fulfill our, uh, the needs of the public um, when attendance has gone up and our staffing um, has continued to be minimal or below. Uh, you know, on the part of um, filling and retaining um, skilled, motivated workforce. Um, two things that we are interested in seeing in the rest of this year and into 2023 is really a full implementation of our DEI process. Um, last report that I'd heard from our Workforce Diversity Committee representatives is that we were still having issues with um, getting reports uh, from the consultant. So we're really looking forward to seeing that process um, start to make some forward movement and seeing results in our hiring uh, process and employment numbers. Uh, and then we also would really like to see the district be um, forward thinking and, and uh, proactive in really providing the best benefits available to our employees, you know, specifically thinking about uh, our telecommuting policy. The district has recently um, notified the union that they want to sunset the pilot program um, despite really not fully implementing that process. Uh, we still have multiple um, grievances that haven't been resolved uh, really because there's been a broken grievance process. Um, what we negotiated wasn't really implemented and now the district's looking to uh, renegotiate that agreement with the district uh, when really it hasn't been given a chance to thrive. Uh, and if we don't do that, like that is a, a benefit that is very important to people um, and also has real benefits to the park district in terms of uh, not in, in reducing carbon footprint, um, both within uh, employees having to move around different parks for meetings, um, but also just whether or not they have to, you know, work on a computer at Peralta Oaks or can do their job um, more often at home. Thank you, Ross. That's your time. Thank you. So closing comments, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, I really like hearing the needs from each of the divisions. Uh, uh, it really, uh, it sets a tone, I think, and then gives it gives us, especially uh, 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 myself as a board member to, uh, to take all that in and to hear what everybody else needs. To, and um, I think it helps. And then uh, I just wanted to add one one question. Then I'm, I'm sure Eileen's at the fire at one of those fires. But uh, regarding the uh, canine program, I I would really look hard at that program because I don't think we really need a canine program. I mean, we all the search and rescues I've ever um, uh, participated in and and seen recent ones. Dogs don't play a major major um, part in, in a lot. They, we we allow time for those, but uh, and sometimes we delay searches. We're waiting for the dogs, but they don't often uh, they get that effort and and time that um, they don't often find any anything. I, I'm, I could be wrong. I'd like to see some statistics on that, but in my my anecdotal experiences, dogs haven't been that useful, but, um, and especially when we have helicopters equipped with um, infrared for search and rescue, um, and, and there are other, I mean, now if we incorporate drones, um, I'm sure they could be equipped with uh, infrared as well and others. So I just think uh, as far as a canine program, I really don't think we need one, but uh, I'll leave that 
for everyone else. But I really like this process. Um, uh, I think it's a good idea for the board to hear what all the divisions need. And uh, I think it's very, very, very helpful. And um, so, so thank you for, for all your efforts in, in bringing this information to us. Uh, I wish we had a little more, more time. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Dee. I'm, just gonna, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump off and let you all finish because I've got to get to another meeting. But thank you so much, everybody. And we'll we'll talk soon. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye. -bye. Colin? Same here. I have to go too. Thank you to everybody for the great presentations and look forward to um, putting our thoughts together at a future meeting. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. Bye bye. Thanks, Ellen. Now. Okay. So, yes, um, I, th I thought this was um, very interesting uh, sort of mid year check in with with uh, all the divisions. And I, I particularly like it because, you know, when you uh, are reading the, the budget, um, there, there are many other things to, to look at at the end of the year. And this uh, allows you to talk in a, in a different, somewhat different forum about uh, things of significance out of, out of the different divisions. So um, I, I like this very much. I, I, um, wasn't wasn't really a board study se session, but it was very um, enlightening, and um, I'll look forward to summarizing things then with the next session. Thank you, Dennis. Any closing thought? Well, sure. Yeah, and, <laughs> um, yeah. I think this is a great process. I really enjoyed it. I love hearing all this stuff. I but you know, and I sort of agree with Rosario. I think. It, I don't want to scare anybody and I don't, I don't have really thought this through, but it's, it's interesting to think all the great things you propose. It's all wonderful and it's all great, but it does cost money. And I think it's really important that we get a chance to kind of weigh in on things because I totally agree with the dog deal. Also, I, I don't have a whole lot of information, but uh, I, I sort of, from my experience of what we're going to use a dog for an hour a day is just probably wouldn't pencil out in our organization. Uh, so I, I, I hope we get included in some of those things. Um, so thanks, but it was excellent day. Yeah, it really was. Now, at first I was disappointed that we cut ourselves out of this because I was so looking forward to hearing my wonderful ideas that I <laughs> talked about and, and, and yours too, my <laughs> colleagues too, um, and the opportunity. Uh, but in the end, I've realized that this really has better informed my own prioritization. And I'm going to be working my my uh, my own outline uh, between now and whenever we get to do this. Um, I would urge that it be done sooner than later, just because they're really good ideas. <laughs> I'm just assuring you. Just ask me. <laughs> so, um, on a serious note, though, it, they were very informative. They were. Um, uh, 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 what I really appreciated was hearing some of these as concepts, you know, and that you're not going to even be certain how it's going to end up getting to us and what it's going to look like. Uh, that being informed early in a, a process is a, a real good uh, thing to have uh, as we go into our own uh, prioritization. So I, I do appreciate all that. Uh, any closing thoughts? from the general manager or any of the AGMs? No, just great, great work from all the AGMs. And I wanna just on the record, apologize to Deborah Rocker because she does have her presentation, which we will include in the packet and um, you'll, you will get that. Um, and just thanks for your patience as we do try to tweak this. I know we tried to pack a lot in the agenda today. So um, we will just keep working on it and looking forward to the next one of these. It worked out fine. So yeah. thank you. So we stand adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>